Welcome to my channel, Midnight Stories, where you find horror stories that scare you. Before watching, please press like to support me in producing more stories. This helps in spreading the video and reaching more people. Thank you for your support and enjoy watching. So, there's a device here which perfectly translates speech to text. I'm currently sitting in a freezer. It's the safest place here and I don't think I'll be caught. There's a whole load of computers and old laptops just like in the main lab, but this thing can turn my voice into words. Okay, so, I'm not cold anymore. I should feel this place, the deathly temperature enveloping me. But I can't feel it. I wish I was cold. It was supposed to be a fucking youth retreat. Mom thought it was the perfect vacation, a trip to Iceland during the holidays. I've never been abroad before, so this was my chance to branch out and actually go somewhere with my life. Mom didn't mean to, but she was unintentionally smothering me. I'm 18 years old, and I was yet to leave the confines of our tiny little town. The brochure and website looked promising. Described as a once-in-a-lifetime getaway to northern Iceland, the more remote parts away from the bustling city of Reykjavik, and the temptation of tourist spots like the Blue Lagoon. It was a modern toasty cabin in the middle of nowhere, a youth center specifically built for lost kids trying to find themselves. They really hammered that in with every page. It was impossible not to get lost in the idea of strangers turned soulmates. The brochure's front cover was a photo of the cabin at night lit up in cozy golden light under the famous Aurora Borealis. There were glossy, full-spread pages of photos of students with their arms around each other, their smiles wide, eyes gleeful and excited. There were luxury hotel rooms, an all-you-can-eat breakfast buffet, a heated swimming pool both indoors and outdoors, and a chance to see the northern lights in the flesh. Seriously, this place looked incredible. I was taking a gap year before heading to college. I had two summers' worth of savings. So a trip to Iceland, also known as the Land of Fire and Ice, was a step in the right direction of finding myself and my identity after being cooped up with my mom for 18 years. I didn't question any of the red flags in front of me. So in a way, maybe being in this situation is our fault. The plane ride was five hours, a pretty short flight, but I still managed to sleep for most of it, zonked out on anxiety meds mixed with Red Bull. The Final Destination movies had really screwed with my head. The guy sitting next to me with a thing for old-school noir gave up on his dog-eared copy of The Maltese Falcon, the cover was already giving me pretentious film student vibes, and watched the flight path on the screen in front of us. I was conscious for maybe twenty minutes in total on the flight, the first ten minutes in the air, trying not to throw up from the pressure, and pressing my face against the window, staring at the blur of white enveloping us. And then three or four hours in, when the pilots excitedly told us all to look out of the windows, where we could just see the northern lights as the sky was starting to darken. That was when I realized my seatmate had personality, the way he was shaking me awake with eyes and grinning lips like we were kids on Christmas morning. Hey! It took him nudging me maybe four times to spring me from slumber, drool pooling down my chin, my cheek uncomfortably pressed to the window. Ugh! Look! He shoved me again, and still disoriented and kind of nauseous, I focused on where he was pointing, blinking rapidly. He didn't know my name, so the guy resorted to just repeatedly stabbing me with his index, hoping for the best. The rest of our group were freaking out, yelling, some of them crying. You would think the fucking plane was crashing. When my seatmate leaned over me, prodding the window, I followed his finger. The sky was a crystalline blue color that was bridging twilight, but I could still see them. I remember my stomach turned, Red Bull creeping back up my throat. We were so far up, almost in space, so far from home, so far from the ground, and yet I felt completely and totally at peace. I remember my seatmate shuffled closer to me like he was trying to bond, trying to share an experience. The guy was older than me by a few years, early twenties. Between his mop of unruly brown curls and southern accent, he was cute in an endearing way. He smelled like sandalwood and fall leaves. His flickering breath in my face reeked of the mint candies he was chewing on. At that moment we were both real and human, and witnessing a sight that was almost painful. The type of pain that stole the breath from your lungs. There they were, an intense greenish-blue illuminating the almost night. 
If I had a gun to my head and was forced to pick a favorite moment from this trip, I'd say watching the northern lights with a complete stranger, the two of us bouncing in our seats like two toddlers, was definitely a human moment I will never forget. Before everything went downhill and our cozy trip to Iceland became something else entirely. I should have noticed things were shady from the get-go. The flight was just kids on the excursion. I thought it was a usual economy flight until my seatmate pointed out the lack of adults. We were supposed to land in Akureyri Airport. It was the first stop on our carefully put-together itinerary on the app, but the pilot insisted we were taking a detour due to weather patterns. When we finally landed, I noticed we were in the middle, and I mean the middle of nowhere. The unnamed airport was empty, bar an American guy in his mid to late twenties with a two-wide grin, holding a sign with, Hi, I'm Jake, your camp leader. It's nice to meet you. Written in bubble writing. Kinda juvenile. Camp? I shot my only friend, my seatmate, who was still being stubborn about his name, a panicked look. His optimistic smile didn't waver. Winter camp, maybe. They probably call it something else here. Pulling my hood over my ears, I was shivering. But this place is empty. My unnamed seatmate shrugged, wrapping his arms around himself. It's got a KFC. He nodded at the familiar logo several feet away. See? We're fine. It's shut. I hissed out, ignoring his raised brow. Looking closer, the store looked almost abandoned. There was a notice on the door, but I couldn't read it. I don't think it was ever open. Well, it's winter. This guy had an answer for everything. Maybe it's shut for the season. It's mid-December. I wasn't convinced, tightening my clammy fingers around the handle of my suitcase. The only thing stopping me from going into panic mode was Kelly Clarkson's under the tree, playing over the intercom. Now that I think about it, I think that was my splintering point. There was just us, a silent airport, and a Christmas song crackling over our heads. Yeah, but it's fried chicken. I had to raise my voice over the saxophone solo. I would understand an ice cream store being shut, but KFC? He snorted. Another song started up, a popular hit. This time I reveled in its familiarity. My seatmate nudged me to the catchy beat, and I almost stumbled off my feet. You're paranoid. Creepy, the brunette behind us muttered, a slight Scandinavian tinge to her accent. I could barely see the girl, a bright pink scarf wrapped around her neck and the bottom half of her face, light brown hair sticking from a knitted hat. She introduced herself as Aurora, to which my seatmate had responded with a grin. Yes, like the Borealolis. Her parents were obsessed with the country, so the name felt right. I was thankful for Aurora's presence. According to my seatmate, Aurora was like a tour guide up until the detour, occasionally offering her skepticism. She had no idea where we were, and Aurora knew northern Iceland like the back of her hand thanks to her mom being born in Selfoss, a town further south. This was her eighth trip to Iceland, apparently, and she had never heard of or seen this place, which was concerning. I was already overwhelmed with the lack of the people, the stark emptiness of the airport, and the temperature already bleeding into my bones. I could see the night sky through a clear glass roof, inky oblivion with no stars, no moon, no light. Through the automatic doors at the exit was the same. Darkness that was impenetrable, like this tiny airport in northern Iceland, was completely cut off from the outside world. The others were already questioning our camp leader, who was definitely a frat boy in college. Jake reminded me of a surfer dude, or the lead love interest in a teen drama. He spoke with his hands, gesturing wildly, like, Yo, yo, chill, it's all good, man, it's chill, bro. This guy had definitely been thoroughly trained to keep the peace, ignoring questions like, Where are we, and why can't I get a signal? He successfully evaded the subject by promising exactly what was on the brochure, spewing the exact same shtick while landing us out into the dark, straight into snow up to our ankles. Jake admittedly did a great job of at least trying to keep up morale when the ice-cold chill slammed into us. What was advertised on the website and on the itinerary was an Uber straight from Akureyri Airport. But we weren't in Akureyri. I had no idea where we were. I expected at least some signs of life, traffic on the roads, or maybe convenience stores. No. The roads were blocked with snow and the sidewalk was black ice. There were no street lights, no traffic lights. I fell twice, almost taking my seatmate with me. 
In front of us was the dark, nothing but pooling oblivion, a vastness that was almost breathtaking. I wouldn't be able to differentiate the ground from the sky if it weren't for the snow. Aurora, for once, was not helping. She was making me more nervous, repeatedly telling us that it wasn't normal for there to be no streetlights, no sign of civilization in any direction I turned, my breath caught in wisps of white. When we boarded a rickety coach, she commented that her vast knowledge of Iceland ended right there. She had no idea where the fuck we were or where we were going. When the bus only drove us further into the dark, down winding roads between snowdrifts, I couldn't resist speaking up. Until then I had been relying on radwimps, playing on 6% phone battery to loosen the knot in my gut. Where are we going? I demanded, leaning over in my seat. Jake's response was almost a knee-jerk reaction, his head whipping around, smile broadening. Don't worry, we'll be there soon, was all he said, like this guy was a stuck record or a confused robot. Now that I was really looking at him in the striking light bathing the bus, I was sure this guy wasn't blinking. His smile was too wide, almost eerily so. Why not look outside? You might be able to see the northern lights. He had repeated this over ten times. I stopped counting when we left the airport. Look outside, look at the northern lights, was all he said, occasionally commenting about how good the outdoor pool at the campsite was. Oh, so now it was campsite. I tried to be positive, despite my slowly thinning sanity. I tried to think camp was another way of saying youth center. I even tried one last look outside, desperate to see anything. Anything that would give me hope we weren't being lured into a place of no return. But there was nothing. When I pressed my forehead against the frosty window, there was no light at the end of a seemingly endless tunnel under a suffocating sky, only a slowly collapsing pinprick growing progressively more narrow. The only light was the illumination from the headlights splitting the road in half, and even they were starting to flicker out as we delved into nothing. Leaning back in my seat, I clung on for dear life as the bus flew over bumps in the road. I'm going to die, I thought, just as the bus slid sideways before righting itself. Jake, of course, was quick to settle our panic. This is going to be fun, I promise. He honked out a laugh when the bus flew over another bump which sent my head smacking into the window. Stars in my eyes, not in the sky. My seatmate asked me if I was okay. His clammy fingers entangled with mine. He was shaking. Still didn't tell me his name. Jake's laugh grew raucous in my spinning head, my mind drifting into fog as the bus continued on further and further into the void-like tunnel with no ending. Wait until you see the pool. I don't know if it's evident from the tone in my voice. I don't know if it comes across in writing, but there was no youth center retreat. There was no warm cabin, no heated pool, unless you count the hot spring that was just a hole in the ground. Several feet away from me. It wasn't even a campsite. Jake was the only one with a tent, and his was more of a glamping luxury with a bed. When we asked where ours were, he spouted more bullshit about it being a fun survival exercise, and we would be taken to the retreat the next morning. If you survive, he winked, before disappearing into his abnormally large tent. So that left us fending for ourselves. Jake wasn't answering questions, or was answering questions with cryptic answers. We made a fire, which had taken us ten-plus attempts due to the ice-cold wind blowing it out, and our slowly diminishing sanity. We did have the natural hot spring, and were taking turns dipping our toes in. I think it hit me when frostbite was starting to kick in, and I had stopped dragging myself to and from the hot spring to plunge my hands into our only source of heat. I was starting to lose track of time, trying to submerge more of myself into the water as the night went on and the temperature dropped. Aurora told me I was making it worse, so I slumped down on rock-hard ground, pulled my legs to my chest to conserve body heat, and allowed my dizzy thoughts to drift. It sounded like the perfect vacation, that's what I thought, drinking in each face in front of me, our small huddle of shadows around a slowly dying fire. Sitting in minus temperatures directly under the northern lights sounds good on paper, or watching a TikTok wrapped up in bed. Those videos have all been perfectly edited to catch your eye. The Blue Lagoon, famous volcanoes and hot springs, the culture and food, but actually being in the raw, unedited footage they don't show. Sitting on frozen ground in front of blurred oranges your brain isn't sure is fire or the sun, any heat being whipped away by the ice-cold wind chill slowly freezing to death. 
and I mean all of you. Your bones and blood feel numb, your skin doesn't feel like yours, and your thoughts are scattered between memories of home and hope that help might come. Also chocolate fudge sundaes. I was wrapped up in three coats. Aurora's lips were turning blue. The sky was oblivion above me. No stars, no northern lights. Conversations varied from fear that we were going to die, absolution that we were going to die, and then threats to kill Jake. We planned it all out. When we were still coherent, Penn had devised a plan to steal the guy's phone. We had all agreed and repeatedly said, yes, we are going to do this. But I'm not sure how to describe the onset of hypothermia. Confusion. Penn said three times that he was going to steal Jake's phone, but he was still sitting across from me, frowning at the fire. His head was cocked, and when I really concentrated, I could see icicles slowly spreading across his brow. I wasn't sure if I was seeing things, but after dazedly staring at my seatmate for a while, I realized I had imagined he had a name. Penn. He still wasn't giving me his real one, despite his hands in mine. I had a moment of clarity, which was quickly suffocated by a chill that almost knocked me backwards. Wait, no, did he tell me his name? No, he definitely didn't. So why was his name on my tongue? Penn. His jacket was over my shoulders, while Aurora's was hanging off of his. I had Nick's gloves, and Nick was borrowing my sweatshirt. Ethan had one of my socks, and Sonny was wearing my jeans. Does anyone have any spooky stories? Penn broke the silence, which was starting to sound like death itself, so quiet and yet peaceful. His teeth were chattering, rubbing his hands together. Ten minutes earlier, he'd tried to stuff his hands into the fire. Nick stopped him. Just, I still didn't know his name. Penn's smile was the shell of his former self, no longer a wide grin bursting with optimism. It was more of a grimace not even trying. I could see icicles forming under his nose, too. That was kind of worrying. Did hypothermia include turning into ice? I thought, angling my head to see him better. No, I was probably hallucinating. Pressing my head into my lap, I exhaled breath into my hands. It was freezing cold, almost enough to snap me out of it. I was so fucking cold, and nothing was going to get better. I had half a mind to slice open my hand to feel the warmth of my own blood, but I couldn't bring myself to move. Moving was tiring, and I just wanted to go to sleep. I've got one. Nick mumbled into his knees. I thought he was asleep, his body very slowly tipping into Ethan. Once upon a time, a group of people sued their psycho camp leader for abandoning them in the fucking cold. Penn nodded slowly, his arms wrapped around his legs, chin resting on his knees. That was beautiful, truly poignant, Nick. I noticed Penn's voice was slurring a little. In the flicker of orange flame, I noticed his breath wasn't reacting with the cold air anymore. Strange. I remember rocking back and slamming back first onto the ground. I didn't move, closing my eyes until Aurora dragged me back to a sitting position. Stay awake, she told me. I tried, but it was hard, especially when I stopped feeling cold, and suddenly I was all warm and toasty, ready to sleep. I was curling into a ball and burying my head between my arms when Penn once again stopped us from falling. Anyone else? I cracked one eye open. Aurora's eyes were flickering. Ethan's were closed, but he shook his head. Sonny wasn't moving. The blur of blonde curls and woolly hat that was the girl was curled up on her jacket. It looked like her body had already started to harden. I'm just resting my eyes, was what she'd said. Nobody commented that her lips were blue when she said that. When Sonny stopped responding, none of us really announced that she was dead. I had half a thought to maybe cover her up with something, out of respect. But then I started thinking about hot fudge sundaes instead. Sure, I've got a story. The British accent snapped me to fruition, like a nuclear bomb had gone off behind me. Lifting my head from where it had been uncomfortably lodged in my arms, I blinked. No, I definitely wasn't seeing things. There was a shadow looming over us, two others in the corner of my eye, which didn't make any sense. We were completely alone, stuck in the middle of nowhere. So how could they be here? Sure, I would entertain the hallucination. The kid was our age, blondish brown curls and clad in a frozen letterman jacket hanging off of him. His face was too pale, like he was one with the snowflakes swirling around us. I focused on his friends, a guy with a shaved head, 
and a tiny redhead in a blue and gold cheer skirt. Her clothes confused me. Who in their right mind be wearing a cheer uniform? All three of them were barefoot. The British guy slumped onto the ground and held out his hands in front of the fire almost mockingly. I stared real hard at him before I remembered our fire blew out a while ago. Penn looked like he might speak, questioning why these three barefoot kids were in the middle of nowhere. But I don't think he could. Nick had slowly lifted his head, but I don't think he was fully conscious, only regarding them with a frown, eyes flickering, lips parted. The British guy cleared his throat. All right, are you guys ready to hear a spooky tale? He laughed when the redhead shoved him with a smile. They weren't cold. That's all I remembered thinking. Neither of them were wearing coats or shoes, no thermal clothing to shield them from the cutting chill slicing into the air. There was once a group of campers who were abandoned by their head counselor. He caught himself, mocking a frown. Wait, no, that's you. Shit, sorry. Let me start again. Sure. Penn was smiling, his head bowing. I kicked him to keep him awake. Alive. Okay, so once there was a college football team. His smile faded, and I noticed how dark his eyes were, two hollowed-out holes in his head. The crest on his letterman jacket looked old. They were good, like really good, good enough to make it to the championships. This guy had a good storytelling voice, keeping us all awake with over-exaggerated voices and actions. But, unknown to them, their fates were sealed aboard their doomed flight. He cleared his throat. And what did their school do? Fuck all. What did their town do? Nothing. His grin lips split into a grin. They didn't want the team to win. They wanted them to lose. So they covered it up. Sonny was speaking. Wait, no, Sonny was dead. That was my voice. The British guy nodded grimly. Bingo. Do you want to guess where their doomed flight landed? He didn't wait for a response. Yep, you got it. Iceland, the middle of fucking nowhere. The guy screwed up his face. I'm talking about the parts of Iceland that haven't even been discovered yet. They did find help eventually, and promise of shelter, a youth retreat with a steaming pool, both inside and outside. I was slowly taking in his words. They were kind of familiar. The boy leaned back, running his hand through his hair. First, he paused for effect, they had to survive the bitter chill of night, and come morning, they would be taken to safety. The boy held his finger to his lip. But they came to realize that being left out to freeze was just the beginning of adaptation. He jumped up, circling around our group. One by one, they started to succumb to the cold. His voice grew louder. But this wasn't the usual cold, man. This is the type of cold that becomes part of you. He stepped in front of Penn, reached out, and poked the boy in the face. The leader was first, he mocked. He was so tired, tired of having hope, tired of trying to keep himself alive. I started to wonder if this guy was more than a hallucination. When he moved, the snow seemed to dance with him. Others followed, he continued, all of them dropping one by one, breath by breath, until only one was left standing. He crouched beside Sonny, traced his fingers across her cheek. But they didn't die, the British guy's tone hardened. I noticed his friends looked uncomfortable. They weren't allowed to fucking die, he spat, straightening up. Soon they were out of the cold, escaping death by a surgeon's hand. The redhead jumped to her feet, motioning for them to go, but he continued. Now prisoners and reluctant test subjects of a mad scientist trying to turn fantasy into reality, they were no longer human, their thoughts filled with cravings they didn't understand. I nodded slowly. And did it work? I asked through numb lips. Did the mad scientist succeed? He caught my eye. Sort of, he said. First they shined bright, truly. They were the epitome of what he was trying to make. However, humans aren't cut out for that kind of change to their anatomy. The mad scientist watched in horror as each of his shining stars failed, bleeding out on the surgical table. He incinerated their bodies and continued his experiments on unsuspecting students. His lips split into a grin, sharpened incisors resembling fangs. I remember wondering how he was doing that thing with his face. Like that was impressive. Even for hypothermia-induced hallucinations, there was something coming alive in his face, inky darkness spider webbing under his eyes, bleeding into his iris. But, he caught my eye with a grin, 
then pens. We were the only ones awake, alive. His first subjects were the start of it because they... He tipped his head back and blew a raspberry. Nick dropped dead at that moment, his body slamming into the ground with a meaty smack. The British guy barely noticed. Well, I guess they were the start of something, even if that led to failure. Huh. Good story. I wanted to clap, but my hands weren't moving. None of me was moving. The guy mocked a bow when his friends dragged him back, elongated fangs folding back into his mouth. The end. I think I passed out once the words left his mouth. No, I was still awake. I could hear the crunch of his toes in the snow. I felt my body hit the icy ground this time. I didn't feel the need to get up or open my eyes. But when the crunch of his footsteps collapsed into white noise in my skull, I forced my eyes open. The standout gold in his jacket was startling against the backdrop of snow. There were smears of red where they shouldn't have been, tears and stains I didn't notice. Or maybe I didn't want to notice them. The more I looked at his fading shadow, I wondered if he was real. And when my gaze lazily found the back of his head, the bleeding black crater-sized cavern carved in the back of his skull, I knew. Sorry, fuck, I'm okay. I'm sorry. It was a long time before he spoke again. By then my ankles were being violently tugged. I was flying. No, I was in someone's arms, clinging to the heat their body was giving off. My head was hanging at an odd angle. I remember they dropped me. I hit something hard and I was seeing shapes. Still no stars or northern lights. For what? This time the red-headed girl was standing over me. Her eyes were sad. When the smooth metal of something was pressed into the flesh of my temple, my body jerking to the side, I asked again, For what? But I couldn't move my lips. The passage of time seemed to speed up. One minute I was lying in snow, a baggage of figures hanging over me, ghost football players in the backs of my eyes, and the next I was lying directly under blinding light. I wasn't cold anymore. The shadow collapsing onto a figure moved in snapshots of consciousness as I bled in and out. I counted consciousness in the light fixtures. Every time they flickered, I knew I was awake. Blink. My brain was burning, my body was alight, and I was shaking, jerking side to side violently. A gloved hand held me in place. Blink. I was screaming. A deep, raw cry ripping from my throat. I could feel the teeth of a blade cutting me open. Blink. Lemonade was forced through my lips, then hot cocoa, then Coke, Pepsi, hot fudge sundae. When they were blinking on and off, erratic, while my body was forced onto my side, then my stomach and back. I was guzzling soda that tasted a little too thick. Then a sharp prick in my neck, something slid into my vein. Whoever this person was, they took their time drawing my blood, as if reveling in it. When the lights flickered for the last time, I caught it perfectly, a single flash in my vision, light that had shadows to it, light that was made of dust, and light that she colored. I was sitting up, primed on my toes, something warm and slithery squelching between my fingers. There was frost on my fingers, tiny shards of ice pushing through my skin and spreading at the back of my throat. Another prick, and I was falling. I woke up more coherent, my wrists strapped down, this time dazedly watching a gurney squealing past me. The blankets covering the body were stained an odd shade I had never seen before. Red had never looked so good. Like I could reach out and drain it from the blanket, sucking away every stain. I didn't realize I was fighting my restraints, trying to claw for the bloody blanket, when a mangled arm slipped from the table. The beaded bracelet he had been wearing the stupid thing jingling like crazy when he was trying to wake me up to watch the northern lights. I still didn't know his name. I watched suited figures and figures in white haul the boy into their arms and throw onto an incinerator. Aurora followed. I could see locks of her hair, then Sonny, Nick. I watched all them shoved through cruel metal doors and burned to ashes. I don't think I cried. Maybe I did, but I think I forgot how to. A week after I saw them burn, I was let go to get comfortable with my surroundings. I tried to kill my creator, but he can't seem to die. But he does give me food. Yesterday I found Pen. Inside a giant glass box, the guy's eyes were a strange color, almost tendril-like darkness spider-webbing under his eyes. When he saw me, he opened his mouth and smiled, and then ripped the head off of a bunny rabbit hopping around his cage. I told him with my eyes that I will get us out of here. But looking outside, there is just sky and snow. 
The sky is two colors, pitch black and crystalline blue. There are no northern lights. Mm. The location is hidden when I check. There's just a large patch of white. Can someone tell me where we are? And if you find us, can you help us get out? I promise, I'm not a monster. I just want to go home. I have been a hunter since a very young age, a wanderer of the silent woods, a stalker of the croaking marshes, a drifter of the sighing deserts. My father was a hunter, as was his father. I would say it runs in our blood, but I think it runs through all of us. Some have just let it crawl into the darkest corner of themselves where it sits and longs for the feeling of dirt and wind and snow. It's the primal part of us that exists despite the nine-to-five slog, the grocery stores we patronize, and the concrete forests we call home. We make enough money to provide for our family and to send the kids to football practice. But something has been lost. We long for a struggle that tests our fortitude. The rewards of the endeavor are redemptive, yet like a rat in a trap, people don't know how to release themselves and be truly free. The shackles of modern living are strong, but there is a key. Stepping outside the safety and security we understand, and challenging the natural world that we lost acquaintance with so long ago. I am grateful for my father who introduced me to the harsh beauty of the world. It made me strong, self-reliant, liberated, enlightened. I remember walking through the cornfields of South Dakota with him, dry corn stalks whipping across my face, squinting against the lashing onslaught. We were hunting pheasants, and I wasn't old enough to hunt yet. I could barely see over the tops of the stalks. The hunters walked ten yards apart down the corn rows, pushing the pheasant out in front of them. The bitter wind howled in an attempt to mask the explosion of wings, and the pheasant took flight. They erupted seemingly from nowhere. It was always in that moment of flight when they were backlit against the feeble sun where everything ceased to exist. Life's greatest and most troubling questions were brushed from my mind as the pheasant burst forth from the earth. The male's streaming tail feathers and colorful plumage popped in contrast to the gray sky. I swear I could even see the yellow iris and pupil that seemed fixed on me alone. If the call of rooster from a nearby hunter didn't slam me back to earth, the crack of the shotgun would. In another moment of time as frozen as the landscape around me, the bird's upward momentum halted and the bird fell, the cornstalks reclaiming what they had lost to the sky. My brain once again registered my surroundings and I cheered with those around me, and the hunter picked up the bird. For one last moment the yellow iris stared at me before disappearing into a game bag taken from the land. I learned a lot from my father about hunting. He taught me about animal behavior, tracking, the weather, and terrain. The more you understand an animal, the more successful the hunt. In Southern California, we hunted quail in cold woods, where we yearned for the sun to break over the tops of mountains that were black like pitch. As we walked through the dry grass, I was self-conscious of the crunch of vegetation under my feet and the snap of branches that cut through the air. The air itself seemed disapproving of the blundering noise we created. As we walked, we would occasionally stop and listen for their distinctive call that would guide us to them. Silence was their savior, and their calls were a beacon to us. We would share a glance and eagerly quicken our pace to catch our quarry, and just where we expected them to be, they materialized, their camouflage so complex that it was as if the ground itself was fragmenting and scattering in every direction. As we pursued them, my father would hold out a hand and I would stop. The silence was so complete that I would breathe through my mouth to avoid the chill air whistling through my nostrils. My heart skipped when a quail flew from a bush and beelined for safety, and as I struggled with my cold wooden thumb to get my safety off, my father had dropped the quail with a single shot. The silence, punctuated by the shotgun blast, was replaced by the ringing in my ears. As he retrieved the bird, I asked him what he had stopped me for. He said that the silence and unknown bring more fear than what is seen and heard. The brain can process a direction to flee when danger presents itself, but when the danger is unseen and unheard, it creates a panic. This panic drives the bird to flight when its camouflage would easily conceal its presence from us. As hunters, we are always trying to exploit a weakness in our prey, leveraging their natural instincts, such as the drive to eat, drink, and mate to our advantage. 
When hunting predators such as coyotes, the sound of a dying rabbit playing over a speaker was irresistible to them. To add to the illusion, we would place a mechanical box in the middle of a field, with a wire running from it to a furry object with a tail. The mechanical box had a motor that would whip the wire from side to side, giving the appearance that a panicked furry creature was injured and thrashing around. The screams and thrashing brought out a compulsion that the coyote could not suppress. Coyotes would come running towards the decoy at a dead sprint, and by the time they realized what had happened, it was too late. A .223 varmint round put them down quick. We used calls for other animals, too, from the massive moose that glided through the snow and trees like wraiths to the ducks that dove from the sky to land on misty ponds. But calling isn't as easy as blowing on an instrument. There is technique required utilizing a specific pitch, pattern, or sound in order to create the desired effect. Every call meant something different from feeding, mating, fighting, and warning. If the wrong call was used at the wrong time or with an improper technique, it could spook the prey. There were many times where I attempted to call an animal only to have it turn tail and flee in the opposite direction of me. An effective call could mean the difference between a successful and unsuccessful hunt. Every game animal required a different set of skills and techniques in order to successfully hunt them. Part of the thrill of hunting is becoming a master of every style and the continual process of self-improvement. What I hunt varies from year to year. Depending on how busy I am during the season, I can sometimes travel out of state, but often due to work, I stay local and hunt within a few hours of my house. It was early on in the duck season, and I had gone to a local honey hole that many people were not aware of. I rarely saw other hunters in this area, so it was a good opportunity for me to walk through the marsh and by the river in silence and solitude. On this particular morning I pulled up to the dirt patch on the side of the road where I parked my truck and shut off the engine. I got out and was greeted by a chill, moist air. I was within a couple miles of the ocean so the air was always somewhat damp and salty. The river and marsh were briny, and the level of the water was impacted by the tides as they rose and fell. I shut the door, leaving the warm truck cab behind me. I started to walk down the dirt path that paralleled the Martian River. I enjoyed the walk. Even in the off-season, I would come here and walk to enjoy the cool air, the smell of salt, the cry of the local fauna, and the rising of the sun that brought the promise of a new day. Even on a slow hunting day, there was still a lot to enjoy. There was a kingfisher that would perch high in the trees, his bright blue body like an orb of water pulled from the river, purified of mud and silt. The sentry scanned the water with his keen eyesight. Then, when he spotted his prey, he dove from the tree, tucking his wings to his side as he pierced the surface of the water. He would emerge with a sprinkling of water that was caught by the weak dawn light. Shimmering like the scattered drops of water was the small fish that was speared upon his pointed beak. He would return to his branch to consume his meal. There were ospreys that dove for fish in the river as well. Gulls and cormorants began their exodus from the coast to inland waters to feed. Vultures, like torn black rags, circled above. I even saw a seal swimming down the river, presumably heading back to the sea. A stoic great blue heron stood in the middle of the river, absolutely motionless. The slender bird deftly maneuvered his way through the muck and reeds with his skeletal legs, head bobbing and cocked to gaze into the water. I observed the lord of the river, his stature creating a commanding presence. As I approached, the stilt walker clumsily took to the air with a croak that belied his majesty. I continued my walk. I looked down at my gun. It was a twelve-gauge under over browning. No polymer like the newer shotguns, just wood and metal with intricate engravings in the metal. I broke open the barrel and inserted two three shells, snapping it shut. The sky was lightning and I gazed downriver. It was hard to tell due to the light, but there seemed to be some ducks out on the water about one hundred yards from me. I crouched down and slowly moved towards the bobbing black blobs on the surface of the river. I used the bushes to my advantage as I stalked closer. When I thought I was close enough, I burst forth from the bushes and my quarry took flight. A quick evaluation of the flight pattern and body structure told me it was a duck. I raised my firearm, looked down the length of the barrel, and led the flying bird with the bead. 
I made sure to smoothly track the bird, took a deep breath, squeezed the trigger, and continued to follow through after the shot. The duck's wings promptly folded and it plummeted to the water. I ejected the spent shell and gun smoke filled the air in my nostrils. I was wearing chest-high waders so that I could remain dry while retrieving the ducks from the water. The first couple feet were always the worst. The mud would sink me up to my knees for the first few steps, threatening to apprehend me. But once in the deeper water, the river bottom became firm. I reached my prize and picked it up from the water. I gasped. It was one of the most beautiful ducks I have ever seen. The majority of the front of its body and chest were covered in white plumage. It had a shiny black stripe that started at the base of its neck and traveled to the tip of its tail. But what was most beautiful was its head. Towards the top of its head was a white spot like a cotton ball. At first I thought the area of the head surrounding the white spot was black. Upon further inspection, I realized that as the rising sun struck the feathers, they turned an iridescent purple and green. I pondered the implications of this color scheme and wondered about its evolutionary benefit in the continual survival and propagation of the species. And then I realized that it didn't matter. Reducing the beauty of this creature to blind evolution seemed to be a disservice to its creation. It was a masterpiece that I could not take for granted. I decided to call it early and place the warm body inside my vest as I made the walk back to my truck. I got home twenty minutes later, and my grandpa greeted me as I came through the front door. My grandfather had been a hunter, too, that is, until he had his stroke fifteen years ago. He had a hard time getting around, and so he had been giving away his hunting rifles and shotguns over the years. He was eighty now, and when it rains, it pours. He had many health issues, and he had moved back with my parents so that they could help take care of him, as it became increasingly more difficult for him to take care of himself. But despite his circumstances in life, he was a man of faith, and I admired him so much for that. I attempted to live with the same faith that brought him peace and joy, even as his health faded. He saw everything as a blessing, even the tragedies. He saw beauty everywhere. That's when he noticed the duck. He couldn't see very well, so he asked me to bring it closer to him. I approached his wheelchair and held the duck up closer for him to see. He peered through his enormously thick glasses at it and stared for a moment. Then he looked up at me and said it was the most beautiful black and white duck he had ever seen. He told me I should take the duck to a taxidermist to immortalize its beauty. I told him that I would. He passed away two weeks later. While his death was tragic, we were able to reflect on our fond memories of him, especially the last couple of months that he was with us. Everyone said what needed to be said. He made amends. He found peace and he saw the beauty in life. Winter's grasp was creeping across the land, and for me that meant the hunting season was almost over. I thought I would get my mind off things and go for an impromptu hunt for dove out in the desert. I woke up early around 4.30 on a Saturday morning and started my two-hour drive towards Bakersfield. I loved early morning drives by myself. I would usually throw on a podcast, listen to some 70s rock, and cruise in the slow lane. I always loved the journey. I started to head down the winding grade, and in another hour, I was in Bakersfield, as the horizon turned a dusky blue. I turned off the highway and drove through the town until the buildings became fewer, and the agricultural fields dominated the land. There were groves of almond trees in this area, and Dove typically used these fields as flyways. Even before I made it to my destination, I saw the flitty flight pattern of morning doves, their dark silhouettes becoming visible. I reached the end of the dirt road and slowly came to a stop. I turned off the engine and the radio followed. I got out and for a few moments just stood and admired the stillness. Soft bird song came from the grove of trees, the dusty air stank of agriculture, making me realize how far from home I was. I decided to set my chair up on the edge of the tree line with my cooler of water, Gatorade, and a gas station cold cut. Now all I had to do was take it in and relax. Oh, and also be ready to draw on the drop of a hat if a dove flew by. I settled into a more comfortable position in my chair and watched the skies for some time. The next moment, I awoke with a start. The shotgun in my lap fumbled and I almost pitched forward out of the folding chair. I let out a strangled yell at the sudden awakening when I hadn't even realized that I had fallen asleep. 
I took a deep breath and mentally shook it off as my heart rate lowered and my breathing returned to normal. I looked around me. Still no dove flew over the trees. For that matter, nothing was moving. The soft bird song I had heard earlier had ceased. For a moment I thought the peace had been shattered by my violent awakening, and that's why the hair on the back of my neck stood on end. But something persisted. The adrenaline spike should have ebbed by now. But something lingered. Gut instincts are hard to ignore when you're alone in the woods. I tried to focus my attention on my senses. I realized that I had been straining to hear. At first I couldn't tell whether I was listening for anything at all or whether I was listening for something. And that's when I heard it. Well, I couldn't tell what it was yet, but it was certainly a sound. It snaked its way through the grove of trees, slithering across the leaf litter. Despite the now relatively warm air, a chill started at my right ear and traveled down my neck and into my lower back, like someone had whispered in my ear in the dead of night. I looked in the direction that the sound had come from. The trees stood before me. I felt just as rooted as they were. Something kept me from moving forward. My eyes remained fixed on the trees, eyes narrowing. I held my breath, standing on the precipice. Without realizing it, I had taken the first step forward. I moved forward into the silent trees, searching for the source of the sound. I had been walking for several minutes. This silence was not the type that I sought. The ambient noise I had previously taken for granted was now absent. No bird song, no drone of insects, nothing. The only sound came from me wading through the loam and leaves. But the sound was muffled, suppressed somehow, the same way that snow absorbs sound and intensifies silence. These trees were suffocating. I got the prickling feeling on the back of my neck again. I whipped around to look over my shoulder back the way I had come. Nothing. As I turned back, I thought I saw movement out of the corner of my eye, and I spun my head around to see nothing but the bemused trees. I looked down at the ground slightly, trying to center myself. I gripped my shotgun tighter and managed to grin grimly. I really had nothing to worry about. I almost laughed. There wasn't much that would be able to withstand two shotgun blasts, even if it was just birdshot. I looked up again and kept walking. I realized the trees were granting a respite. They were beginning to thin and I felt my tension melt. Then through the top of the trees, I saw a flock of birds, the first living thing I'd seen since I had arrived. I only caught a quick glimpse of them, but I wasn't sure that I recognized the species. Before I could stop myself, I quickened my pace to follow their progress through the trees. Something in the back of my mind whispered to stop, but I only increased my pace, stumbling over roots and rocks, and I tried to keep the birds in sight. I was now running and I couldn't pull my gaze away. The trees rushed by me, and while my mind was now screaming to slow down, look and listen, I was hurtling forward in my rabid pursuit. Suddenly I burst through the edge of the trees and found myself in a clearing. I frantically searched the sky and I saw them. I realized what they were. It was a flock of black ibis. I stared in stunned silence. They were circling the clearing and there were hundreds of them. The sight was overwhelming. They beat their wings frantically like their lives depended on it. Their beaks were agape, and their throats vibrated at an alarming rate. No other sound filled the clearing except for the beating of their wings. Normally I would admire animals in their natural habitat, but something about this was wrong. I didn't know what a flock of black ibis could possibly be doing in Bakersfield. Ibis were typically marsh or wading birds, and could be found near wetlands. Bakersfield was a damn desert if it weren't for the irrigation that supported agriculture. Something about them wasn't right. They were heralds of dread. I felt as if I was about to completely lose my nerve as I stared up at the circling flock, ceaselessly flapping. That's when I heard it, and I knew that it was the sound that had awoken me on the edge of the tree line. It was a female voice, a soft, silky, smooth, sensual voice. It creeped across the clearing coming from the other side. It came in waves, breaking and retreating, crashing and hissing, ebbing and flowing. I couldn't understand what was being said, but I knew what it meant. The harder I tried to make out the words, the more I let go of the world around me. All that mattered now was the voice. It would ebb, and with each flow I was drawn closer. My mind was adrift and I let it float in warm bliss, floating on a clear, warm sea, 
waves lapping my body and lulling me into a state of peace, basking in a green meadow with grass that caressed my face. I was halfway across the clearing, following the voice. That's when she appeared from behind a tree. She was a tall woman with milky skin, her voice like honey. She had thick black hair that billowed despite the lack of wind. She wore a white dress that flowed down to her bare feet. Her body swayed and undulated, just like the ebb and flow of her voice. I was mesmerized. I vaguely realized that my gun was back on the other side of the clearing. Her soothing words stopped, as did I, and we both stood, staring at each other across the space left between us as the ibis circled like fabric of the night stitched to the sky. There was a pause, a serene moment. She was the most beautiful woman I had ever seen. She smiled at me with warmth that I felt in my chest, and it radiated to the rest of my body. Tears filled my eyes as I stared at this radiant woman as the ibis continued their flight. The piece was shattered with the crack of a bone. My eyes widened as the woman's head inclined with a snap and her mouth split in a smile that stretched from ear to ear. Bones cracked in her fingers and toes as her hands and feet lengthened. Her nails grew into thick, darkened claws. I was frozen. Her legs lengthened to spindly stilts with backwards-facing knees, and her arms elongated to her knees. Her previously smooth black hair became matted, dead black strands. Her spine popped and protruded through her upper back, forcing her upper body to bend until she was on all fours. Her previously soothing voice was replaced by something that was discordant, high and low-pitched at the same time, seemingly moaning, screaming, and growling at the same time. My will left me. The creature continued, its unsettling vocalization. The ground around it was torn as soil and grass flew from its fitful transformation. With a final moan, it finally stopped moving and looked up at me with dark eyes peering through that matted hair. It grinned. At that moment it lunged as the ibis squawked above me which tore me from my daze. I dove to the side and as soon as I hit the ground I was up and running, sprinting in the opposite direction. I frantically looked for the shotgun as ibis scattered in every direction, shrieking and flapping. There. I saw it through the flapping of black wings. It was there in the grass. But I had no time to spare. She was unleashing her unearthly call behind me. I sprinted toward the gun and dove toward it as the creature simultaneously leapt towards me, but sailed overhead as I dove under it. I grabbed the shotgun and took off running through the trees with the creature close behind me. My chest was burning and my breath came in sobs. The creature sounded triumphant as it screamed to the sky. As I ran, I opened the barrels and swore when I realized that there were no shells in the barrels and the ones I had with me had been lost during the chaos. I threw the gun away and sprinted further into the trees. I tried to put as many trees between myself and the creature as possible to break its line of sight. Its calls became fainter as I found a tree to hide behind and catch my breath. I sat there breathing heavily, and suddenly it dawned on me with a sinking dread. I was the prey. I felt cold sweat as I heard its distant vocalization. Prey behavior. That is what was going to save my life. All my knowledge was going to determine my fate. Refocusing, I looked behind me and saw that my trail through the trees was pretty clear. I swore silently and saw movement between the trees. A glint of black eyes, pallid skin, a stretched smile. I ripped my gaze away and found the nearest tree, climbing into it and tearing the skin on my hands as I climbed. I reached the top of the tree, huddling in the foliage. I had to cover my mouth to stifle the sobs and gasps for air. A couple minutes passed in silence. Suddenly I looked up into the branches and saw a dove, the first one that I had seen since this morning. It was huddled as close as it could get to the trunk of the tree, and its unblinking eyes were fixed somewhere in the direction from which I had come. I stared at it with dawning realization. I hadn't seen this dove or any other for that matter as I walked through the trees until I came across the ibis. If I couldn't see the birds in the trees, then maybe this thing wouldn't see me. I grasped the trunk and held my breath. That's when I heard it, shuffling and dragging through the dead leaves and black hair littered with filth. A low, warbling hum was emanating from the creature. It resonated in my chest, and I felt that this low-frequency sound was going to expose me. The creature continued disjointedly ambling with its head swaying back and forth, searching. 
I don't know how much longer I could hold on. Tears were streaming down my face, and it was everything I could do to stop myself from crying out or gasping for air. The creature continued this sound and turned its head. It was angled away from me, listening. I saw the corner of its mouth rise in another horrifying grin. It moved out of sight. And then there was silence. The same awful, deathly silence. The creature was nowhere to be seen. I remembered the quail in those cold woods so many years ago. Their panic was their downfall. But the silence was pressing in. I felt the urge to jump, to flee. Just as I thought I was going to lose my composure and scream, a dove burst from a nearby tree, darting and weaving through the trees. The creature vocalized its discordant call, and it galloped after the panicked bird. After the footfalls had faded to silence, I let out a gasp and gulped in air as I shakily wiped the sweat from my face. I began my descent through the branches and looked one more time up at the trembling dove perched in the tree. I broke my gaze and began my sprint through the trees, silence but for my racing footsteps through the leaves. The creature was somewhere in those rows of trees waiting. Then I heard it again, that cry. I picked up my pace as I saw something pale loping through the trees, like a dog running through tall grass. The sight was enough to break me, but adrenaline pushed my body to move as fast as it could. I saw a flash of reflected sunlight through the trees. It was the reflection of a pond. I didn't know what else to do. I ran straight for the pond, noticing the reeds and heavy brush that sprouted up from the water. I grabbed a handful of brush and covered my tracks the best that I could, shakily brushing the ground. I slipped into the cold water and it clawed at my chest as I gasped. I embedded myself in the thick reeds and sat still, already shivering from fear and the penetrating cold. The galloping footsteps came closer and the creature appeared at the edge of the pond. It was low to the ground, crawling along the bank. I looked down at my shaking hands and my heart dropped. Blood. I was bleeding from the tree that I had climbed. Without moving my body, my eyes tracked the creature's movement. It was staring at something on the ground. As I watched in repulsion, a thick, grotesque tongue emerged from its maw, and it dragged it across the ground. I closed my eyes and huddled into the reeds. Did it know where I was? Was it toying with me? I opened my eyes and the creature was gone. For the first time I looked around. Through a gap in the trees I could see my truck. I wanted to make a break for it, but I had no idea where the creature was. That's when I heard the rustling in the treetops. Between the dark foliage, I could see glimpses of that skin like sour milk. It was stalking me. It knew I was close. The foliage rustled once more, and then it was still. Minutes passed, and then an hour, and the cold water was beginning to take its toll. My muscles ached, and I felt drained. There was no denying my situation. The creature knew I was close, and it was only a matter of time before it flushed me from hiding. Then the voice. Don't go, my love. We could have so much fun together. I want you. I need you. I saw a glitter of black eyes like chiseled flint. I clenched my fists and looked towards my truck. If I was going to run, it was going to be on my terms, not when that thing found me. Then I heard another voice, a male. Hey, is someone out there? I saw your truck. I jumped with a start, and before I could stop myself, I broke for the bank and yelled, Yes, I'm here in the... And I cut myself short as I realized my mistake. The creature leapt silently from a tree and stood at its full, formidable height. I backed away slowly, shaking at the nightmare that stood before me. Without taking its eyes off me, it began to bob and jerk in a mechanical motion. It was moving imperceptibly closer to me all the while, swaying, rolling, leaping and bobbing. I was transfixed by its unnatural movements, and I felt like I could neither fight nor run. My limbs refused to obey me as my mind floundered with thoughts none of which I could focus on. It got closer yet, still grinning at me with a mouth that seemed to be nothing but sharpened teeth jutting out from stretched lips. It crouched within an arm length of me, and it extended its face toward me from its crouched position. It inhaled deeply through its nostrils and shook slightly as it exhaled with an excited whimper. The eyes rolled back in its head with unrestrained glee. The massive tongue flopped from its maw and it grabbed my bleeding hand with a vice-like grip. I fell to my knees as its grip forced me to the ground. The tongue wrapped around my hand, slurping and lapping at the wound. I couldn't avert my horrified eyes as its breathing grew quicker and heavier. 
The tongue retracted back almost unwillingly, and it refocused on me. It flung me into the pond with contempt, and I hit the water. Before I could orient myself, it was upon me, and I flailed, trying to reach the surface. I opened my eyes underwater and came face to face with it, inches away. Its hair flowed like a billowing dark cloud. It screamed in my face and bubbles obscured my vision. With panic filling me, I lashed out and caught it in the stomach with one of my flailing feet, pushing it away. I seized the moment to push off from the ground and broke the surface with a gasp. I desperately swam for shore, not looking back to see if it was following. I clambered onto the slick bank and then felt that iron grip clasp my ankle. I looked back and saw its head half submerged in water and black hair spread across the surface. The grip clamped harder, and blood mixed with the mud and water as claws sank into my flesh. I screamed and blindly lashed out with my free leg trying to dislodge it. It only dug deeper and screamed. One of my kicks landed and it loosened its grip enough for me to make it onto the muddy bank and slipping and sliding. I made a hobbled sprint for the truck. I gritted my teeth and broke through the tree line. I reached the truck door and ripped it open as I clambered inside. I slammed the door shut just as the creature burst forth from the trees, loping towards me. I turned the engine over, putting the truck in first and dropping the clutch as I shot forward with dust boiling up behind me. It kept pace, lashing out its long arms against the truck until I punched the truck into second gear and sped away, leaving it behind in the dust. As the dust obscured the creature, I saw the silhouette change to that of a woman. She didn't move as I lost sight of her in the rearview mirror, now going sixty miles an hour down the dirt road. After I had put a few miles between myself and the creature, I skidded to a halt, not even bothering to engage the clutch, killing the engine and bringing it to a halt. A mixture of relief, dread, and fear washed over me, and my head hit the steering wheel as I sobbed. I couldn't process the events, and I could do nothing but weep. I didn't try to understand or make sense of it. I let it wash over me. I sat stunned and shaking as my brain finally realized that I was safe. I looked up toward the horizon with a shaky breath. I started my truck again and made the journey home, leaving the danger behind, but not the horror that I experienced. I don't hunt anymore. The joy and peace I experienced from being in nature was extinguished. My pride I once found in bracing myself against the brutality of the world was dashed and irreclaimable. That part of me was beaten into submission and left to lie in a dark corner of my soul, never again to see the light of day. The beauty I once found now refuted by the monstrosity that lurked in the trees. Everything I thought I knew about the world had been flipped upside down until I didn't know what to believe. I wrestled with the existence of that creature. I couldn't believe that such a creature could be created by the same thing that created that black and white duck. The contradiction drove me to madness. No, I was looking at it all wrong. It was always there, I just didn't realize it. Nothing had changed. These circumstances didn't change the way the world worked, the brutality of it. I was a monster. I always had been. But now I know. I am not the only monster that stalks the earth. One day in September of 1983, we decided to go on a patrol camping trip so that we'd get some prizes at the end of the year. Our scout troop owned a campsite up on top of a big rocky hill. It was just our rotten luck that when we agreed to meet to start the camp out, there had been a steady rain going on all day that didn't look like it was going to stop for hours. But our parents were all either going away for the weekend or thought rain was no reason to cancel a camping trip. Anyway, it was just barely going to be warm enough for this to be our last chance to have a patrol camp out that year. There were four of us trudging up one of the thin paths on the hill with our limited gear under dismal green ponchos. Me, Eric, Tony, and Sam in that order. We were miserable and irritable except for Tony. We had reached a point where we enjoyed hurting Tony. Tony was one of those kids that get put into Boy Scouts of America only because they have a parent that wants free babysitting. I imagine most of the time his mom mostly talked to him by yelling at him, and the only way he knew to relate to the rest of us was to annoy us. He was also the youngest guy in my patrol, and the shortest, so it was fairly easy for us to bully him, especially when we thought he was doing his best to bring it on himself. 
I think Tony was delighted that the rest of the patrol was already on edge, so it would be easier for him to get a rise out of us. At that moment he had decided to focus on Eric. Eric was a real goody-goody most of the time. He was a pretty good athlete and an A student. I'm pretty sure that at fifteen he'd never had sex, a puff of anything or any booze. But he loved beating on Tony as much as the rest of us did. That seemed to be his only vice, and frankly it kept the guy from creeping me out by being too perfect. He'd certainly looked ready to give someone a beating when I glanced back at him during that little hike. Hey, Eric, Tony said. I glanced back over my shoulder. Tony had run up next to Eric like a puppy dog because he knew otherwise Eric would ignore him. There was barely room on the path for him to do that if he turned himself sideways. What? Eric said. I can read your mind. Sometimes Tony would be weird or still like a little kid when he pestered us. Okay, Eric said. I looked forward again. Think of a number. I can guess it. Tony was pitching his voice up. Okay, Eric said. It's thirty, Tony told him. No. You're just saying that. Really, I was right, wasn't I? Huh, wasn't I? From the sound of Poncho's rustling, I assumed that Tony began to push against Eric. He would do that for minutes on end if you'd let him. Sometimes he might even start humping your leg if you were another scout. Get away from me, Eric said. I didn't see it, but it was obvious even before I turned around what had happened. Eric thoughtlessly pushed Tony away, just wanting the little creep off him. As narrow and slippery as the trail was, he had pushed Tony off it. Tony screamed as he went down the very steep portion of the hill, almost catching several trees before having his legs tripped out from under him by a stump. The stump was unfortunately only a little uphill from a large sandstone rock. Tony went into it head first with the sound of a loud crack. I stared at him for half a minute or so then, and he didn't so much as a twitch from what I could see. Oh my God, Sam said after a long silence, which seemed to snap the rest of us out of it. Let's go help him. Yeah, I said. Back then, this meant running down there to carry him to the nearest house out of the park, since cell phones for kids were still decades off. I tried to start down the trail, but Eric was still standing in the way. He turned to me. We've got to tell people what happened right. Sam stopped and looked over at us. Eric looked down at him. We need to tell everyone that he slipped and fell, got it? We've got to help Tony, Sam shouted. And we will, Eric said. But first, we need to be clear that we're going to tell everyone that he fell, right? You got me? That's what we tell everyone? I don't know, I said. I didn't see it happen. Eric looked at me and nodded. That seemed good enough for him. Then he looked back at Sam. You pushed him. We have to help him, Sam said in bewilderment. Sam had never been the cleverest guy in the patrol, but I would have thought he'd have the sense to play along under the circumstances. We will, Eric responded. But first, I need you to say that you'll tell everyone that he slipped and he fell. I nodded desperately at Sam, gesturing for him to tell Eric what he needed to hear so that we could get down there to try to help Tony. No, Sam said. Eric stared at him. All right, Eric said. Let's go. We walked quickly, not about to run for fear of slipping and falling like Tony just had. It wouldn't have done you much good anyway. Sam said after a little while, apparently trying to help Eric feel better. Tony still would have told everyone you tried to kill him no matter what. Yeah, but that's Tony. Who'd have cared if the rest of us had our story straight? Eric answered, his voice flat. He seemed to speed up from behind Sam. Which way do you think would be the fastest to— Hey! Eric grabbed Sam. Sam yelled as Eric dragged him to the edge of the path. Say it! Eric shrieked. Say that you'll tell everyone that he slipped. Eric sounded more scared than intimidating as he held Sam at the edge of the path, seemingly ready to let him fall. Fuck you! Sam yelled and he began to flail. He hurt Eric more than I would have expected, judging by how Eric grunted. Maybe it was pure adrenaline, but Sam got free somehow and began pushing him to the other side of the trail, right into a cliff. Jesus Christ, stop fighting! I yelled at them. I might as well have been speaking Chinese. I took a few steps closer and saw there was murder in both their eyes, so I stepped back. Sam got his hand on Eric's chin and pushed his head into the rocks behind him as hard as he could. Eric was really trembling then, like an old man with Parkinson's. It was as if he was experiencing a panic attack in the middle of a fight. Even so, he wasn't going to just take Sam's beating. He grabbed Sam again and kind of picked him up like Sam was a tackling dummy, 
and then charged forward blindly, Sam's poncho over his face. He misjudged the distance to the edge of the path and both Sam and he went rolling down the hill. They struck trees with sickening noises as they fell to a level area. They were much more fortunate than Tony. I could see their movements and hear them screaming when they stopped falling down the hill, but neither of them even tried to get up. I walked as quickly as I safely could down the trail and then looped back round to where Sam and Eric were. Both were yelling for my help at first, but as I proceeded down the trail, Eric abruptly went quiet. My leg's broken, Sam told me as soon as he saw me arrive where they'd fallen, the bones sticking out. It was true, his poncho had folded up and I saw the bulge in his lower left pant leg beneath the knee. Blood had soaked through his pants with the rainwater. Hey, Eric said flatly. His lack of emotion made me look over at him as Sam screamed at both of us. I think I hurt my spine. I can't move my legs. I can't feel them. From what I could see of how his body was twisted, that might well have been possible. I didn't know then how Eric could be so emotionless about it. But in hindsight, of course, he was in shock, if not in psychological denial. All right, guys, I'll go do what I can for Tony and then I'll get help for everyone, I said. Sam screamed at me that that was the wrong thing to do that I should leave the park to get help immediately. For all my first aid training, I didn't know if either of us were right. I thought maybe there was something I could do with the first aid kit for Tony, whose injury had seemed the most severe. Maybe Tony had vomited and I had to clear his breathing passage. I had to check on him. I tried to reassure them before leaving. Sam swore at my back as I ran over to Tony while Eric remained quiet. I ran to where I'd seen Tony's head hit the rock. I had walked by it on hikes and camping trips numerous times and knew the rocks and trees. I'd seen the rock that Tony had hit his head on numerous times and knew when I'd reached it. When I did, I froze for what felt like minutes. Tony was gone. There was no sign he'd been there except for some blood had pooled by the rock where he'd struck his head. It was still wet and red on the sandstone. I looked around and called for him. I ran a short distance each way around the rock. I didn't see a sign of him, not a footprint in the mud, nor a drop of blood, nothing. I something else as I searched. Sounds seemed to be fading away. I could hardly hear the rain around me. I couldn't even hear my footsteps in the shallow puddles on the ground. I couldn't even hear Sam, although I had been seconds before. My own voice seemed muffled to my ears. I had been afraid before, but I'd never known the sound to fade away like that. I began to feel something. Not the feeling you get when you're being watched, but the one you get when someone you fear is standing right over you. I turned, and there was no one there, of course. The feeling didn't let up. It seemed to grow stronger and stronger. There was nothing to hear, not even my own breathing or the beat of my heart. I ran back to where I'd left the other two scouts as fast as I've ever run towards anything. Slowly I could hear again that Sam was still screaming in pain and cursing out Eric. Eric barely moved his head to look at me when I arrived. Sam went quiet after I told them of Tony's disappearance. How? was all Sam could think to say. I felt that sensation again of a presence all around me again. It was faint but noticeable. I don't know, Sam, how are your arms? Can I carry you out of here packstrap style? I had two years and eighteen inches of height on Sam, so I knew I could carry him out. Sam said I would. Whatever presence I was feeling, he seemed aware of it too through his pain, and he didn't need to be sold on being taken out of the park, painful though it would surely be. I got out my first aid kit quickly, left my pack on the ground, and hastily made him a splint. He screamed as I lifted him up on my back. Wait, what about me? Eric asked, some emotion back in his voice. I glanced over at him. His eyes were wide and his skin was becoming pale. I can only carry one person. We'll get you help as fast as we can. But what if whatever made Tony disappear? Looking back on Eric, I find it hard to fault him now. He was just a kid. He'd made a mistake, meaning only a little if any harm. The a smaller amount of harm that we'd all inflicted on Tony time and again. Then he'd seen all his life, all his accomplishments, his future. All about to be tarnished because of what he'd accidentally done to someone we all mostly thought of like dirt. He overreacted like probably many of us would back when we had little life experience and perspective of a guy in his lower teens. But at the time I just glared at him for a second as he lay twisted and helpless on the ground, reaching up to me. 
Maybe you deserve it, I told him. I turned my back on him and began carrying Sam out of the park. Hey, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to hurt Tony. I wasn't going to drop Sam. I was bluffing. I'm sorry. I'll do anything you want if you get me out of here. I'll give you everything. Please, don't leave me alone. What was that? There's, there's something out here. Come back. Please, I swear that I'll do anything. Please, please, come back. His voice faded quickly and the sound of rain and Sam's pain resumed. As I walked, the feeling of that presence faded as well. I had almost a mile to go in the rain before there would be a house with a phone, and Sam was moaning and wincing practically with every step. I made slow, frustrating progress for a few hundred yards before I slipped and landed heavily on my left knee. Sam screeched in my ear after his upper chest hit my shoulder. I think I broke a rib back there. You can't carry me like this. I didn't know how he could have broken a rib and only started to feel it now, but I wasn't about to argue. As carefully as I could in my anxiety, I placed him on the ground in a sitting position and switched the carrying style to firefighter carrying style so that he was mostly over my shoulder. Is that better? I asked him when I'd hoisted him back up. He had winced again as I held him up. It still hurts, but it's better. We rounded a curve on the trail and were approaching a fairly gentle slope where the parking lot was situated. I thought of it then as the end of the park. Sam had begun to feel easier to carry, so I felt then I'd be able to make it out of this forest. I remember that since I'd been in the park many times before, and even with another scout on my back being carried like this who was constantly voicing his pain, things were coming back to normal. Whatever feeling I'd experienced over where I had thought Tony disappeared was going away. Things began to feel so normal that the idea Tony had just gotten up and walked away, and emergency services would soon find him, was believable. I guess what I felt then was that all I had to do was carry Sam, and then it would be up to the adults to take care of all this. Oh, Jesus, Sam suddenly said quietly, run, 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 fucking run. Before I could ask or turn to see what I was to run from, he struck me as hard as he could on the side. He did this again and again, even after I started running. It was difficult to run even a few steps with such a heavy, awkward weight. It became easier when I noticed something that was already too familiar. Sam's voice became quieter even as he thrashed and screeched more shrilly on my back. He might have said what it was or described anything about it, but within seconds he was as muted as my silent steps in the puddles on the pathway. I reached the bottom of the incline. Sam was convulsing then, which I felt was a sign that whatever I was trying to flee was getting closer. He was still hitting me in the side, but it was weaker and more erratically. The path up the hill was full of loose rocks and gravel. In weather like this, it was impossible to keep a solid foothold, but by some miracle I was able to run up it and maintain a hold on him, even as he practically seemed to be trying to break free and I was trembling. I remember thinking that I faintly heard something then, something like a splash. That had to be a good sign. Halfway up the hill, I felt a horrible sensation in my feet. They were going numb. I remember not understanding why, and even with all the momentum I had built up, my feet landed awkwardly, like I'd slipped on ice but still landed on my feet. I barely had time to feel pain in my ankles because they went numb as well. I was barely able to stumble forward before the numbness climbed up to my knees. My legs were useless then. I fell forward practically face first. Sam got free even with his fractures, flipped over and crawled up the hill. I tried myself. I could feel the numbness had reached my ribcage by then, but dragged myself across the rocks. I remember perfectly the sight of Sam dragging himself too while twitching and trembling as he crawled. A force hit the back of my head that felt like a construction beam dropped from a crane. My face went into the ground, rocks stabbing into my cheeks hard enough to break the skin, and I seemed to lose all fight-and-flight instinct. I just lay there like a breathing corpse. Even if I hadn't been numb, I didn't have any energy, any hope, any understanding of what was happening to me. I didn't even have the courage to lift my hood up and see what was happening around me. I don't know how long I lay there. The numbness left me, but I still didn't lift my hood. So little light was coming in under my hood that night might have fallen, and I wouldn't have been able to tell. A long time later, the rain stopped. Long after that, I began to hear again. I heard birds tweeting, cars driving by from what sounded like miles away. I didn't move. 
After a long time of only hearing the sounds of nature, I heard footsteps approaching me. They stopped suddenly, and then clearly changed to those of someone running up to me. Are you all right? An old man, whose name I don't remember, said as he leaned over and pulled my hood back. I looked up at him, rock still stabbed into my face. He winced as he saw it. Christ, kid, what happened to you? I don't know, I said. I still don't know. I don't want to. I know that Eric, Tony, and Sam were never found, nor was any trace of anything that might have made them disappear. I learned even that reluctantly. Look for answers? Hell, I don't even go near forests any longer. Staying away from forests isn't enough. I have developed a need for sound, always. After a minute without hearing something, I feel anxious. Sleeping without it is impossible. If whatever got my fellow scouts comes for me, I want as much warning as I can get. That brings me to the reason I'm sharing this. Lately, even with music at full volume and me screaming my lungs out, I've been experiencing minutes of silence. At home, at work, out driving. When I've gone on visits, I've been experiencing it. It's been many years since the end of my last camping trip, but it seems like I'm about to feel that presence again. When it wants, I believe it will make me experience a silence that will never end. The camper van is there again, in the field behind my neighborhood. If I stand on the tips of my toes, I can just see it over the tall stucco fence in my backyard, the cream and brown stripes along the side, its darkened windows, its boxy, old-fashioned headlights. I used to work at a tiny dive of a bar in this tiny dive of a town. The owner of the bar, Jeb, decided to make the establishment's sign by hand. He fancies himself a craftsman, I suppose. So for a few years now the already dumpy-looking building has boasted a huge plywood sign with nail-gunned on letters formed from sticks, the kind you would use for kindling. Jeb's place. The man's name is Jeb. Does it get any more hick than that? The only real benefit of living in a completely uneventful place where the population is lower than most city high schools is that even as a 19-year-old woman who worked until three in the morning at a bar called Jeb's Place, I could still walk home after a shift alone without encountering anything worse than a mangy stray cat. On one such night, after a particularly riveting shift listening to Frank McKinsley recount to me, for the twentieth time this month I've kept track, his woeful tale of bankruptcy and divorce and the damn thieving left-wingers. They're all homos. I left work as I always did, with a filched can of Budweiser stuffed in my coat pocket and a handful of peanuts wrapped in a festive poinsettia napkin. We used those napkins all year round, which nauseated me. I have a thing about walking on grass. I don't like it. I figure people invented sidewalks for a reason, and it's so we don't have to walk on mushy, unstable ground all the time like in the old days. But on that particular night, clutching my less-than-ideally cold beer, I was feeling restless. On that night, the frozen air expanded in my lungs and left as steam, and I could see little crystals of water, not quite big enough to be snowflakes, all around me glistening like winter, illuminated by our town's sparse street lamps, one of which was flickering, about to burn out. Maybe it was the quickly cracked and drained Budweiser, or maybe it was just that I had heard too many old-timer stories or maybe just because I was a bored 19-year-old. But on that night I thought maybe it wouldn't be so bad to walk on grassy ground. I thought maybe the feeling of the frozen blades crunching beneath my sneakers would be a new, interesting sensation. So I took a different route home than usual. I cut through the field behind my neighborhood. When this place was a busier center of agriculture in the 50s, I guess, it had a school. It was a small school, only 300 kids from kindergarten all the way to grade 12. But the school had a track and field program, mostly just to keep teenagers out of trouble, in a town with nothing much else to do besides exactly that. Shockingly, the track and field program required a field. No problem, plenty of those around these parts. The lucky candidate was the field near an empty gravel pit that would one day, when local farmers fell on hard times and the novelty of post-war wealth had worn off, become a trailer park. Trailer park, but not in the way most people imagine. To be honest, it's mostly retired couples living there, you know, people who can't go up and down stairs anymore. I guess that constitutes most of the town's population in reality. But I live there too. My parents owned the house when they were alive, but I've been on my own ever since their accident several years ago. I don't have any siblings. Really, I don't have anyone. 
My place is between a blue trailer where a retired schoolteacher, Mac Donahue, lives with more dogs than he can care for, and a brown one where an elderly couple live. Mr. and Mrs. Murphy, who suddenly became weed dealers one day just because it's an easy way to make money. And no one suspects two crotchety old people of dealing illicit substances to bored adolescents, am I right? Anyway, the night I took the shortcut home, it was pitch dark. The glow of the streetlights didn't extend much past the sidewalk, and the moon was just a thin crescent, almost invisible. So while I was enjoying my napkin peanuts and listening to the toes of my sneakers crunching through layers of sparkling frosted grass, I counted my steps. 120, 121, 122, 123. I glanced up to see how far away the back entrance of the trailer park was. The drug-dealing seniors must have still been awake, watching late-night television programs, maybe, because their windows were all alight. I looked way up into the tar-like sky, searching for stars, but none were visible. Only that thin crescent moon. I continued counting my steps, 124, 125. I stopped walking. Something was in the field that didn't belong there. I could just see its faint outline, not even fifty feet in front of me, directly in my path to the back entrance of the trailer park. A shiver scampered from my tailbone to the base of my neck and lingered like a hot cloth at the back of skull. The inky shape squatting in the field was outlined by the moon's faint light, creating the silver outline of a vehicle. I felt a tightening in my chest and abdomen. I guess it was fear or apprehension or something like that, which is odd since I don't really get frightened of things. I started walking again, more cautiously than before, squinting ahead instead of down at my feet. I walked closer and closer to the thing in front of me. 142 steps, 143, 144. I could see once I finally got near to the shape in the field that it was indeed a vehicle. The camper van, just sitting there in the darkness, apparently abandoned. There didn't seem to be any tracks in the frosted grass from where it had driven in, no sign that it had been moved there recently, and no indication that anyone had been around, except for a sinking feeling in the core of my torso, and that persistent warmth at the base of my skull insisting irrationally I knew that something wasn't right, something was wrong about that van. Now I've seen a lot of movies. I mean, maybe not a lot a lot, but I've seen my fair share. So I know how this scene goes. The dumbass character sees something sketchy and checks it out and the mediocre piano score is banging out in the background, and the dumbass on the screen is walking closer and closer to the sketchy thing and breathing heavily the whole time, like a dumbass, and someone in the theater or the living room or the wherever you are watching this horrible movie inevitably whispers, Stop, don't go over there, oh, you dumbass. And that scene always ends the same way, and the whole audience or living room party or whatever collectively breathes a frustrated sigh, as if they had no idea that the dumbass character would act well, like a dumbass. So when I became the star dumbass of my own sketchy situation, approaching a sketchy camper van which apparently materialized in the middle of a field in the middle of this shithole of a town, I did what any sane person would do. I marched right up to that van and I pulled on the handle of the passenger side door. And luckily for my bimbo-headed self, it was locked. Regaining my sense of self-preservation rather abruptly, I backed away from the damn thing as if it was electrically charged, dropping all of my stupid napkin peanuts on the ground. Turning to leave, I made a wide loop around the van and pointed myself in the direction of the back entrance to the trailer park, hustling my arse faster than any arse has heretofore been hustled. I think I held my breath the whole way to my front porch. When I finally released the air trapped in my lungs, it came out like a wheeze, as if I were a pack-a-day smoker. I was shaking and fumbling with my house keys and panting, and when I finally got into the house I slammed the door behind me and locked the deadbolt, promising silently to never, ever trust non-sidewalk walking again. Even then I knew I was being ridiculous. Nothing had happened to me. I had found a camper in a field in the middle of East Jesus Nowhere, in a town where, as I said, kids have nothing to do except get into trouble. If someone was in that van they were sleeping or high off their heads on weed from Trailer Park Seniors Incorporated, or drunk or some combination. 
I took a hot shower and tried to forget about the whole thing, and without too much trouble I fell asleep. When I woke up the next morning, or that afternoon, the camper was gone. And to be perfectly fucking honest, I didn't give it another thought. For three whole years. I quit my job at Jeb's place only weeks after the incident. I got a college diploma in agriculture, like everyone does around here. And since graduating, I've been working as a farmhand at a local feedlot. I'm 22 and I haven't thought diddly squat about that camper van since the night I last saw it. But just seconds ago, in broad daylight, in the middle of summertime, I came outside to replace the suet in my bird feeder. I have a soft spot for sparrows, all right? And that's when I saw it. The damn thing is there. It's there in the field, and I'm getting that tingly feeling in my spine all over again, as if my prey drive is kicking in at the sight of a harmless old camper. Three years. And that thing shows up looking just how it did the night I first saw it. The window in my bedroom is open, and I can hear the TV from outside. In other news, the grandson of a former rebel telephones engineer discovered new evidence yesterday that might be able to solve a 45-year-old mystery involving the bizarre death of a young woman. I reason with myself that nothing bad can happen in broad daylight. So I finish replacing the suet and hoist myself over the stucco fence as the news anchor's voice drifts from my room. Pages contain evidence that the cell phone company was conducting unique experiments. Forgetting all inhibitions about non-sidewalk travel, I start walking toward the van. As I'm moving toward that ridiculous vehicle, I ignore every inch of my body that's begging me to turn back. My heart is pounding. My temple is sweating. I wipe my palms on my cut-off jean shorts, feeling the lump of my phone in my pocket. As I get closer to the thing, I can see the make and model details I couldn't grasp in the darkness three years ago. It's a Dodge Tradesman from the 70s. A totally generic holiday vehicle for a totally generic middle-income family. It is completely unthreatening, and yet I'm terrified. The weather is warm, almost hot, but I'm shivering. I make a wide circle around the front of the tradesman, keeping my eyes on the tacky floral curtains in its windows, tracing almost my exact path, but in reverse, of the night I walked home from Jeb's place three years ago. I'm directly in front of the passenger side door and no one seems to be in the vehicle, so I step forward. Crunch. I look down and move my foot away from whatever I stepped on. There, nestled into the grass right next to the van, is a small pile of peanuts and a crumpled poinsettia napkin, just like what I was carrying the night of my first encounter. I bend down and take a few of the crushed peanuts into my sweating palm. This doesn't make any sense. Surely these can't have been in the field for three years. I lift up the napkin to get a better look, and the stupid poinsettia is in almost perfect condition. As if only moments ago I swiped it from a table at Jeb's. My sense of fear is momentarily replaced by pure confusion as I let the napkin and the peanuts drop from my hands. Compelled by some ridiculous urge, maybe curiosity, I reach for the passenger door handle, inwardly hoping to find it locked, just like that night three years ago. But the door opens and swings wide. I expect a creaking sound or some indication that the van is as old as I think it is, but the hinges function with ease and near silence. The smell of the interior drifts into my nostrils, leather polished wood detailing oranges. My palms begin to sweat even more heavily. Without thinking, almost as if out of some absurd habit, I crawl into the passenger seat. The leather of the seat squeaks against the exposed skin of my thighs. A sharp breath tickles the back of my neck. I whip my head around to face the open back of the van, but there's nothing and no one there. I'm alone, realizing it was probably just a breeze coming in from outside. I pull the door closed. It is utterly silent in the van. I can't even hear my own breathing, but I can feel my heart pulsing in my ears. It should be stifling in the closed vehicle, but the temperature is comfortable. Then I feel a breath on the back of my neck again. I whirl around once more, on high alert. There's no possibility it was a breeze. No windows are open. The curtains aren't fluttering. I rise from the passenger seat, ducking to keep from bumping my head, and I step into the back portion of the van. There's a tiny kitchenette with a table, and a closed closet-sized room that's probably a portable bathroom. Suddenly, inexplicably, the van lurches and I fall to my knees, 
Scrambling back to the front, I try to wrench open the passenger door, but it's stuck. I crawl over and try the driver's side, but it's stuck too. The locks are in the unlocked position. This doesn't make any sense. Why won't they open? The van gives another lurch and I'm thrown into the upright back of the driver's seat. Clutching to the old-fashioned steering wheel for balance, the van continues to lurch back and forth like it's being rocked by a large force from behind. The windows are darkening like the sunset on fast forward. The van is shaking, shuddering, lurching, almost tipping over. And a buzzing pressure is shoving in on my eardrums. I feel a warm trickle slip down the side of my face from my left ear. I'm so dizzy, and my lungs can't seem to grab air, like my ribs are collapsing. I'm trying to scream, but all I can do is open my mouth and struggle to inhale. I try to open my hands to try the door again, but I can't concentrate. I'm blind with panic, and my fingers won't open. They're stuck clutching the steering wheel, and my knuckles are turning white. I feel like I'm being pushed into the seat, and I'm squeezing the steering wheel so hard. So hard that I can't. I can feel the tiny bones in each of my fingers stressing. There's a great pressure on my hands and my head and everywhere. My kneecaps feel like they're being jammed into my shins. I have to stop squeezing the steering wheel or else I can't scream. I can't make even a sound. As the pointer finger knuckle of my right hand abruptly snaps and bursts through the skin. The ring finger follows with a tiny burst of a blood vessel. Something in my left ear explodes. There's a crunch and a snap somewhere near my right knee. I can feel the burning, numbing pain spreading through every part of me. My vision goes red, and the van is still shuddering, lunging forth and back. There's a final violent thrust of the van and a great sizzling pressure over my whole body, and then... nothing. Channel 5 Morning News July 20th, 2016 in other news, the grandson of a former rebel telephones engineer discovered new evidence yesterday that might be able to solve a 45-year-old mystery involving the death of a young woman. Here's Melanie Reynolds with the details. Thank you, Jackie. In March of 1971, the body of a woman in her early 20s was discovered near the Rebel Laboratories building in New York. A positive ID was never secured for the woman, and no missing person reports were filed that matched her description. She had severe injuries on her hands, and she seemed to have died of a massive brain hemorrhage. Even more mysterious was her clothing, which was made of materials that forensic experts at the time could not identify. While the woman's death was ruled suspicious, no suspects were ever arrested in connection with the incident. Then yesterday morning Ben Matthews found a journal that his grandfather had kept during his employment at Rebel in the 1970s. The journal's pages contain evidence that the telephone company had been conducting unique experiments in fields such as teleportation and time travel, which seemed to involve the use in some capacity of a Dodge Tradesman camper van. Yes, you heard that correctly. Time travel experiments with a camper van. Some speculate that such experiments could account for Rebel's sudden declaration of bankruptcy in the early 1980s. A source tells us that one portion of the journal reads, the woman was dead when she arrived in the tradesman, and that it mentions a strange device in the woman's pocket, which resembled a telephone. Although we cannot be sure if the woman mentioned in the journal and the woman found near the rebel building are the same, we can be certain from the content of the pages that the company was experimenting with more than mobile phone development, and police say they will be conducting a full investigation of the claims made in the book. Although former Motorola engineer Martin Cooper is credited with the successful development of the first mobile phone in 1973, it is well known that workers at Rebel were developing similar technologies during the same time, and that information and blueprints often leaked between the two companies. Some theories are already circulating which try to link the mysterious woman in the journal and her strange device to Rebel's attempts at mobile phone development. Back to you, Jackie. Thank you, Melanie. Sounds like something out of a science fiction movie, ha huh, ha. Huh? Now, over to Cal Mencken for sports. Mac Donahue was walking his dogs in the field behind his neighborhood when Ginger, the tiny spaniel he had adopted just a week earlier, sprinted off and snuffled eagerly at something in the grass. Frightened by recent stories of dog poisonings, Mac jogged over shouting, No, Ginger, drop it. Don't eat whatever that is. But when he got to where she had been snuffling, he found only a small pile of peanuts and a slobbery poinsettia napkin. Damn litterers, Mac muttered. 
He pulled Ginger away by her collar and shooed the other dogs from the garbage as well. Then he continued on his peaceful summer walk, reveling in the uneventfulness of his quaint little town. In the morning, she goes to wake her friend so she won't be late for class. She doesn't realize right away why her friend isn't answering, why she's not getting up. Then she pulls back the blanket. Her friend's throat has been cut open so deeply that her head almost falls off when she puts a hand on her shoulder, her dead eyes staring up in horror. That's when the girl notices. Above the bed, scrawled in her friend's own blood, are the words, Aren't you glad you didn't turn on the light? Chloe laughed and clapped her hands. Jesus, Sarah, the look on your face. It's a story. Relax. It's not just a story. You hear about things like that happening all the time. My cousin's ex-boyfriend knew someone that actually happened to. No, he didn't. That's what everyone says, and it is never what actually happened. Because it's a story. It's not real. I like stories better when there's some kind of a happy ending. Happy ending? What are you, twelve? Besides, those aren't the kinds of stories you tell when you're camping. Sarah rolled her eyes. She had never been camping before and was starting to regret being talked into it. But she'd known Chloe since the third grade. This wasn't the first little adventure she'd been talked into. I don't even know why I agreed to come out with you. Me neither, actually. I was a little surprised. She grabbed a few small sticks from the pile next to her and threw them into the fire. Especially because of what happened here. Don't start. You already scared the crap out of me. You hit your quota for the night. It's not a story, it's history, Chloe said, leaning forward. You can Google it. No reception out here, remember? Fine, fact check it later. Is there a chance in the world of convincing you to do anything else? Dancing naked by moonlight, for example? Chloe shook her head. Well then, by all means, go ahead. It was a long time ago, maybe back in the 40s or 50s s, when a troop of Girl Scouts came out to the woods here for a camping trip. Chloe, are you serious? Everyone and their mother has heard this story. Girl Scout troop goes missing. No clues, no suspects, blah, blah, blah. It's like you just said, it's a story. No one even knows if they disappeared from these woods, or at all, as a matter of fact. Everyone says that. No one looks it up. I told you, you can find it online. The whole story's there, the real story. And I'm telling you, they didn't disappear. Sarah hesitated. She really hadn't wanted to hear that story again. Not in the middle of the woods, in the middle of the night, with shadows pressing in on them from all sides. But she was curious now. So what happened then? Chloe grinned and moved closer to the fire. The plan was to work on basic survival skills, you know, how to start a fire, how to build a shelter, how to find fresh water, that kind of thing. I guess it went well at first. Maybe they went fishing. Maybe they set up their tents. Who knows? What they do know for sure is that they definitely got a fire going. The trip was only supposed to be overnight. Everyone was supposed to be back home the next morning and plenty of time for lunch. No one came back. And when all the parents of those girls realized that not one of them had made it home by two o'clock, they called the police. You can't imagine the panic. Seven little girls and their troop leader missing. No cell phones back then, no GPS, no way to know where in the woods they might have set up camp, or even if that's where they still were. Most of the cops in the county, all the parents plus friends, neighbors, teachers, practically the whole town came out to help. By the time the sun started going down, everyone started to get nervous. They hadn't found anything and it was starting to get dark. Shadows stretched out on the ground and reached down from the trees. The further they trudged into the trees, the harder it got to see. Just before real dark, someone found them. They almost tripped over the first body. Six of them sprawled on their stomachs, a look of complete terror on their faces. It looked like they had been trying to run from something but didn't get far. Whatever it was, it took down all of them. Fast. They were only feet away from each other. Each of them had been slashed from the shoulder blades to the backs of their knees, down to the bone in some places. The parents had to be taken away. Pretty much everyone who had helped a search was in hysterics. Throwing up, fainting, some of the mothers started screaming and had to be taken to a hospital and sedated. They identified five of the girls and the troop leader, but one of them was missing. Melissa Vare, Missy everyone called her. Her body wasn't with the others. 
They wanted to find her if they could. So the cops, who were the only ones left searching, went further into the woods looking for Missy's body. It was true dark when they found the remains of their campfire. And Missy. She was sitting on a rock, close to where the fire had been, nothing but a sweater wrapped around her shoulders. When they got close to her, tried to get a blanket on her, she started crying, rocking back and forth. When they tried to lead her away out of the woods, she panicked and started to scream. All she kept saying was, don't run, don't run, don't run. They got her out eventually, I don't know how. Maybe they carried her. They said that she wouldn't move a muscle on her own until she was back on the road and out of the woods. The murders got pinned on her. Nobody liked it, and I'm pretty sure no one believed it. A tiny nine-year-old girl mutilating six other kids and a grown woman, then going back to sit in the dark by the burnt-out fire for more than a day? No, I don't think anyone believed it. But they had no other answer, and Missy never spoke about it. The only two words anyone heard her say again after that night were, don't run. They locked her up in an institution somewhere. As far as I know, she's still there. But think about this. If Missy didn't go crazy and murder her Girl Scout troop that night, then something else did. And it could still be here, waiting. You know you're full of it, right? Are you serious? First of all, that's a true story. Sure it is. Just like that mass murderer who escaped last week. I hear he has a hook for a hand and has been hanging around Makeout Point. I don't even know why I bother with you. Chloe stood up and grabbed her flashlight. Fine. I'm going to pee. When I get back, maybe you can tell me a story. Like the one about the girl who let Mark Kramer get into her pants last Friday night. Sarah dropped the stick she'd been poking the fire with. What are you talking about? Oh, you didn't hear that one. I guess it is fairly recent. Most people don't know about it, yet. Face burning, Sarah scooted back from the fire, even though it wasn't why she felt hot. She considered denying it, laughing it off, telling Chloe she was crazy. But what would be the point? She didn't know how, but Chloe knew. And she didn't want to trap herself in a lie. Besides, she had nothing to be embarrassed about. She and Mark were consenting almost adults. It wasn't like either of them were seeing anyone. And they'd made out for a half an hour, maybe a little more. That's PG-13 at best. I don't know how you found out, but I don't know what your problem is about it. It's not like we were doing anything wrong. I don't have a problem with you two hooking up. I have a problem with you not telling me about it. We were supposed to be friends, I thought. A surge of guilt hit Sarah in the stomach. Chloe would manage to find a way to make this about her. But it wasn't like that. I was going to tell you. It never crossed my mind to not tell you. I just, I don't know, wanted to keep it to myself for a little while. Before I shared it with anyone else. An emotion Sarah couldn't quite read flared, then faded on Chloe's face. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Just, you should have gone after someone else. I've heard a lot of stories about Mark getting what he wants from as many girls as he can juggle. You just should have gone with someone else. With that, Chloe turned on her heel and headed into the trees, the beam of her flashlight cutting a narrow white light through the darkness. Alone, Sarah sat and waited. The sounds in the forest at night were unnerving. She had thought it would be quiet, but the trees seemed to come alive after the sun went down, and everything living in the trees. Some things she could identify, like the crickets and peeper frogs, but there were so many sounds that seemed strange to her. She grabbed a handful of kindling and started snapping the sticks into tiny pieces, throwing them into the fire. Chloe always pulled something like this, always managed to find a way to make Sarah feel awful about herself. And over what? Mark Kramer. Maybe she would ask to pack it up and go home. Chloe would never let her live it down, but at this point, she thought that might be worth it. Besides, it was getting colder, and the novelty of roughing it had definitely worn off. Maybe Chloe would feel the same way, enough at least to give in and take them back to her house. She leaned in toward the fire, stretching out her hands and trying to warm up her fingertips. How far had Chloe gone just to pee? It had been more than enough time for her to go and come back. She should. Sarah heard her name screamed through trees. She started moving in the direction of the voice before realizing she'd even moved. Twenty steps away from the fire, she remembered the flashlight and sprinted back for it. Turning around, she heard Chloe scream again. 
Sarah, help me. She ran toward where she thought Chloe would be, trying to keep control of the black panic that wanted to overwhelm her. Nightmare images flew through her head as the words of Chloe's story came back to haunt her. She thought she saw things in the woods, shadows and shapes moving behind the trees, and tried to ignore them knowing it was just her fear. Fear trying to crowd in on her, trying to get into her head. Running full tilt, Sarah tripped over Chloe's body. She hit the ground so hard it knocked the air out of her, stunning her for a minute. Grabbing the flashlight that had gone flying, Sarah turned around on her knees and told herself that she was not seeing what she was seeing. Chloe was on her stomach, one arm flung out in front of her, the other trapped under her body. No, Sarah said, crawling over. No, no, no. She knew, absolutely knew Chloe was dead. Her skin was stone white under the flashlight, eyes open wide, staring past Sarah. What was she supposed to do? Run for help? Try to carry her out? Pulse? Check her pulse? she said out loud. That's what you're supposed to do. The light shook as she reached out toward Chloe's neck. Inches away from her face, Sarah saw Chloe's eyes blink, saw her lips smile, felt something grab her hand and hold her in place. It happened so quickly, Chloe was up on her knees and lunging at her. Sarah managed to pull free and scramble back a few feet. Her chest stung, and when she looked down, she saw a scrawl of blood from her chest running up to her shoulder. Her jacket had provided some protection, but the cut was bleeding just the same. What? What? Chloe stood, smiling, not hurt, not dead. Sarah's mind tried to convince her, just for one second, that this was a joke. A terrible joke, but not real. What? What? Chloe said, mocking her. You really are pathetic. And you don't even know it. That's the part that kills me. You have no idea. Blinking up at Chloe as she took a step closer, Sarah couldn't manage to say anything her thoughts still trying to catch up to her situation. You really have that innocent act down. Sarah doesn't drink at parties. Sarah's always home before curfew. You don't mind half the guys at school following you around, though, like dogs waiting for a handout. Didn't mind giving it up to Mark Kramer. Some of what Chloe said got through the storm of confusion, even though it didn't make any kind of sense. Mark Kramer? Sarah asked, her voice coming out shaky. Who the hell cares about Mark Kramer? I do, and he cares about me. At least he did until you came along with your good girl routine. I have to admit, it's good. They all want what they think they can't have. Wait, wait, you and Mark? Why didn't you tell me? Because I never thought I'd have to worry about you. Chloe took another step closer, raising the hand that held the knife. Too afraid to get to her feet, Sarah shifted her position around so that at least she was kneeling instead of sitting. This is all because of Mark? No, this is because of what you did to me, and my guarantee that it won't happen again. As Chloe came at her, Sarah grabbed a handful of dirt and flung it at Chloe's eyes. It was a lame deflection, but it was all she had, and she prayed it would be enough to give her a few seconds head start. Sarah ran. She didn't bother dodging or ducking the interlacing branches, just ran straight through them. The only thought in her head was to get back to their campsite, back to the fire. From there, she thought she could get back to the road, at least knew the general direction. Otherwise, she might not be able to find her way out. She might get lost in here, with Chloe. Breaking through the last line of trees and into the small clearing, Sarah didn't stop running at the sight of the campfire and their sleeping bags. She slowed only to grab her pack, which had an extra flashlight, her cell phone, and the car keys. She almost made it. She had a bigger head start on Chloe than she had hoped for, but Chloe had a better arm. An apple-sized rock connected with the back of Sarah's head, and she went down, hands pressed to her scalp. In seconds, Chloe was on top of her, using her knees to pin Sarah's arms. She couldn't move, but struggled anyway. Chloe, please! Sorry, Sarah. Chloe raised the knife, holding it above Sarah's neck. She could see it glinting against the black of the night sky, and closed her eyes, knowing it was the end, waiting to feel the sharp metal cut through her skin. Instead, the forest started to go dark around her. They noticed the fire at the same time, the flames burning out, getting lower and lower as the light went out. All around them, the sounds in the woods died, until there was silence. Neither of them moved. Sarah didn't fight to get away. Chloe didn't bring the knife down. Through the quiet and the dark came the wind. Chloe? Shh. Chloe. 
Shut up. Sarah heard something in the wind, sounding like it came from far away, but was getting closer. A voice whispering to them, Don't run. Sarah felt herself shoved back hard against the ground as Chloe jumped up, releasing her. She called, Wait! after Chloe's running footsteps. Terrified, Sarah got to her feet, feeling very alone. The wind picked up and pushed against her back, the voice whispering again, Don't run. It sounded like it was right behind the stand of trees closest to the clearing, and she could hear something else, too. Maybe whatever it was the voice belonged to. Something that sounded like it was made of sticks and leaves and darkness. And it was coming. Sarah ran. For the second time, she grabbed her pack off the ground without stopping and sprinted toward what she hoped was the car. Something groaned behind her and picked up speed. Dead leaves crackling, sticks snapping. It felt like she ran without breathing, without feeling the ground under her feet. She ran with only one thought in her head. Get to the car. Get to the car. Sooner than she would have believed possible, the tiny dirt parking lot came into view. Her blue VW was alone there. As Sarah darted toward the driver's side door, Chloe tore from the woods on her left. Skidding to a stop, Sarah froze, not knowing what she should do. The keys! Chloe waved her over in a frantic gesture, trying to get her to hurry. Certain it was an awful idea, Sarah ran over, unzipping the side pocket of her pack to get at the keys. She made it to the car and unlocked the doors, thinking, I can't believe we made it, when she heard Chloe scream behind her. Sarah! Something hidden just behind the tree line grabbed Chloe by the ankle and started to drag her back into the woods. More on instinct than anything else, Sarah dove and grabbed Chloe's hand, trying to pull her back. Don't let me go! But Sarah already knew that she was fighting a battle she had no chance of winning. Whatever had Chloe was strong, and soon both girls were being pulled into the trees. They had already been hauled off the dirt lot and were being taken across the grass. There wasn't a choice, not really. Sarah looked into Chloe's wide, terrified eyes and said, I'm sorry, and had to let go. Flailing and shrieking, Chloe was taken into the woods. Sarah didn't waste any time. She raced back to the car, flung open the door, and was clear across the parking lot before she took the time to close it. For a while, the only thing she could hear were Chloe's screams clanging in her head. Then she noticed another sound, a thin, miserable whimpering, and realized it was coming from her. She didn't remember the drive. The next thing she was conscious of was pulling into the driveway. When she got home, she switched on every light, locked every door, calling for her parents. Empty. She stood in the kitchen and cried, at a loss for what to do or even what she should feel. Her whole body shaking, she decided to call the police. She could report Chloe missing, say they'd gotten lost and separated in the woods. Her phone was still in her pack in the car. There was no way in the world she was going back outside, but she had a landline still in her bedroom for emergencies. She dragged herself upstairs and into her room. Exhausted, thinking only of making the call, Sarah didn't notice the open window next to her bed. Not until she felt the cold wind behind her. As the lights in her room started to dim, Sarah heard a voice whisper to her, the same voice she heard in the woods. I told you not to run. Or maybe urban exploration. It's really awesome, like modern-day adventuring. You explore cool old buildings that no one has been in forever. It can be kind of like playing an online MMORPG in that you can run into all sorts of danger. Sometimes you have to dodge security guards, which is really bizarre. I mean, some of these buildings have been just sitting empty for years. Most of them are heavily tagged, and sometimes you risk running into those same taggers. And then there are squatters, some of whom look like actual orcs. It is awesome total adrenaline rush. You can call me Sherry, professional urban explorer. I'm currently enrolled at Colorado State and working on my business degree. I was lucky enough to get an athletic scholarship for track and field, but I also play on the women's soccer team. Go Rams! Because I don't have to work like some students, I have more than enough time to go exploring. We, of course, have our own club. It's shared with the geocaching crowd because we're so similar. We share cool places to go and explore and, of course, pass along tips over the areas we explore. That's how I learned about the old Carnival Hotel in Bivouac, Colorado. 
I guess back in the 1980s Japanese corporations were grabbing up and starting companies in America. I don't know the original company's name. For some reason there isn't much information on our group site. But this company decided they were going to create the Las Vegas of Colorado. I guess they were going to bribe a bunch of the state's politicians in order to make gambling legal. They bought up land along the interstate and were going to create a city named Bivouac. They had even completed a carnival-themed hotel when the whole project ran into financial difficulty and was eventually dissolved. Apparently, the Carnival Cruise Ship Company sued over the use of the name, amongst other problems. They apparently only completed the one hotel and a few other buildings, which are all now owned by the state and just lie there empty. There were some photos posted by other explorers which excited me. Apparently, the hotel had been completed and even housed a few guests before it closed. There were awesome pictures of actual carnival games run in the hotel lobby and of a roller coaster that had been under construction. It was supposed to have started on top of the hotel so that the ride began with a death plunge down the side of the building. How awesome would that have been? Apparently, there was also supposed to have been a house of mirrors. I saw one picture of the doors to that feature. The padlock on the door had been cut with bolt cutters, and you could see a few mirrors inside. The person who had posted the picture left a caption saying, Just don't go in there. Really easy to get lost, and I felt claustrophobic the entire time, like someone was following me, couldn't get out fast enough. According to the group site's details on Bivouac, a security guard drives by at noon once a day. So long as you close the door and they can't see a car, they didn't even bother to come in. I couldn't resist, so I made plans to visit the hotel as soon as possible. In particular, I wanted to explore that house of mirrors so that I could boast online. I took the former explorer's notes as a personal challenge that I was more than willing to accept. He only got halfway through before getting scared and retreating. I had developed a reputation of being a fearless explorer, and I wanted the bragging rights to being the first one to finish the house of mirrors. The drive was far enough that I put off my trip until spring break of that year. I planned to combine it with a camping trip just in case. It's always good to have a cover story in case something goes wrong. Having a reason to be in the area is always a plus. Urban exploration often runs up against the law, although it seems silly to be charging people with trespassing on a building that's been abandoned for 40 years. I packed all of my usual stuff. I doubted I'd need the drone for this one, but I decided to pack it anyway. I might be able to catch some cool Colorado sunset shots. For the hardcore urban explorer, you might be mistaken for a mountain climber with everything you take along, except the bolt cutters. Not many locks and chains on a mountaintop. There is, of course, a first aid kit with bandages and antiseptic. I keep a tightly wound length of nylon rope, a python, and even a climbing harness. Sometimes you need to go down an elevator shaft to reach other floors. Of course, you take everything you need to survive, too, just like on a camping trip. That includes bear spray, good for both bears and the occasional insane squatter. I had a run-in before the pandemic with this one old man who scared me to death. I won't go into the details, but after that I always made certain I had bear spray or a taser. I also wear tear-resistant clothing and carry heavy-duty gloves. Helps with scrapes, bruises, and avoiding tetanus shots. Those are the worst. I hate needles. When I finally set out during spring break, I felt confident that I was beyond prepared. I had researched my target thoroughly on the university computers, because there's less evidence directly linking you. Curiously, I still had been unable to find the name of the original company, which should have been public information. I've encountered that problem before when trying to find records from before the internet was really a thing. Since I didn't want to go to a government office to make an official records request, I would have to hope to find some paperwork at the hotel. But I did manage to get the building's blueprints which I, of course, put on my smartphone. Emphasis on smart, that's me. Or that's what I thought at the time, because if I had known then what I knew now, the last place I would ever have gone to was the old Carnival Hotel in Bivouac, Colorado. Colorado is gloriously beautiful in the springtime, so I took my time driving to the closest camping grounds to Bivouac. My plan was to camp for two days before slipping away to explore my real target. 
By then, I would have established an alibi by telling the rangers I planned to hike further into the park to camp overnight. Smart alibis are a must for the dedicated urban exploring enthusiast. I enjoyed nature for a few days before breaking camp just past one in the morning on the third day and slipped out of the park. That morning I would have breakfast at a small town that amounted to little more than a gas station and a restaurant before driving to bivouac nearby. Nothing ever goes according to plan, but that's half of the excitement when exploring old buildings, and in this case it was the weather. Shortly before I took the ramp off the interstate to bivouac, it began to storm. I knew it was coming because of the lightning flashes that began shortly after breakfast. For me, it really is as much about the adrenaline rush as the discovery. So for me, the storm was actually a plus. My last girlfriend complained constantly that I was an adrenaline junkie. I got her to come along once with me, and all she did was complain the entire time. That's when I realized we weren't really a thing and broke up with her. If there wasn't pot and alcohol involved, she really wasn't interested in something, and I really don't do either. I do like to party now and again, but pot just messes with me too much. The last thing I need is to be hallucinating while breaking and entering. Even though it's legalized in Colorado, you really can't trust something handed to you at a party, especially if it's a guy giving it to you. By the time I crept my beat-up, third-hand old Subaru Justy hatchback into the rear employee parking lot of the hotel, the rain had begun to come down. My trusty Justy, as I like to call it, was primer gray in color, which was the perfect camouflage for these conditions. Even if the security company showed up unexpectedly and actually drove around the facility, I doubted they'd spot my car where I parked her. As I sat in the gray light of the storm that was sending enough rain down to scrub my car cleaner than a car wash could ever get it, I had to admit that the abandoned hotel looked ominous. The sun was obscured by both the cloud cover and the building on this side, so it appeared to me as only a dark silhouette. When lightning flashed, it gave the hotel a creepy aura, like how you would highlight a slasher's profile in the movies. The partially constructed roller coaster death plunge even looked kind of like long tentacles reaching down from the top. My heart was beating fast as I took it all in while squirming into my gear in the back seat of my old trusty Justy. I guess for most other people they might have turned around at this point, but I was in my element. The uncertainty of it all and that edge of fear added by the storm just thrilled me. This was my drug of choice, and I could not imagine any better high. If I had arrived here on a bright, sunny morning with birds chirping in the background as if I were in some family movie, I wouldn't have been nearly as excited. Heck, I might have even turned around from disappointment. I was curious about how neatly kept the building actually was after all of these years. Only a few windows appeared to be broken, and there was none of the trash scattered around outside that you would have found if it had been located in an actual city. If I had just woken up there, I might have thought I was at a normal hotel that was experiencing a power outage. I had halfway feared that there might be a trailer beside the building that belonged to some maintenance person hired to keep the property from falling apart. But so far as I could tell, I was the only one there. Holding my rain poncho overhead to shield myself from the downpour, I sprinted from my car to the closest entrance. According to the site's notes, the previous explorers had found the lock already broken. The wind almost sent me sailing like a kite, but I made it to the door. I had to fight the storm to get the door open because the wind was like a huge man holding it closed. But I somehow got inside. I was, of course, soaked by then. In that type of weather, there really is no adequate type of gear to keep the moisture out, unless you're going for the professional survivalist gear that they equip firefighters and search and rescue with for the field. Inside, the building was cool in the way some place gets when the heat has been set to 55 degrees for years. My breath steamed the air as I took everything in and waited for my eyes to adjust. Outside, the rain sounded like hammers striking the ground. There was a feeling in the air of being watched. That feeling electrified me. No matter where you go, that feeling is always in the air. The suspense at the prospect of being caught doing something wrong slows time, and makes the experience all that much more memorable. I live for that. After a few minutes, I moved down the utility corridor to the main lobby. I planned to make my base camp there. I didn't need to carry everything with me at all times, 
so I usually set up a cache at a strategic central point that's easy to fall back on. As a precaution, I also leave a sealed envelope there that explains who I am and what I was doing there. I keep it buried at the bottom of a small pack so that it won't be easy to immediately find. As long as I keep it in there, I also won't forget it when I leave. The lobby was pitch black. The glass front doors had been covered over with wooden barricades to keep people out and to protect the glass from the environment. To my delight, the carnival game stalls all had their cages open. After finding a place behind the front desk to stash my stuff where it wouldn't be immediately obvious in case security actually decided to came inside, I clipped my two most important pieces of gear to my tactical vest. The first was a battery-operated light. I learned the hard way when I was 15 not to use my phone as my primary light source. That shoots through the battery fast. The second was a sports camera. You know the ones if you've ever watched a found footage horror film. As I made ready to begin exploring, my phone vibrated, alerting me to a post on my geocaching app. When I glanced at it, I discovered that an alert on had been posted regarding a new stash. I had set the app to only alert me if a new post concerning my immediate area went online. Curious, as there were no trails near Bivouac that I was aware of, I opened up the app. Find my stash in the old Carnival Hotel, Bivouac, Colorado, had been posted right about the time I had gotten up for the day. Apparently I had missed the other alerts while driving. That was eerie. I opened up the forum thread regarding the post and read, Whomever had created the post had decided to remain anonymous, which I hate. Never trust an anonymous poster. Too many trolls online to trust those. I primarily scanned the description of the geocache, simply to see if the anonymous poster knew any details about the hotel, in order to decide whether they were legitimate or not. All I found was the same information that anyone could find online, as well as a claim that riches could be found in the carnival's house of mirrors. That told me that the cache was a fake. People don't go geocaching for riches. Usually you find cheap knickknacks in the cache that are essentially trophies to commemorate you having successfully done the challenge. The average geocache enthusiast who sets up a challenge can be very imaginative, and the finds are often cool, but they are also typically cheap trinkets. I think the most expensive thing I ever found the few times I went geocaching was a small, cheap wooden chest full of 3D-printed metal dice that are used in tabletop role-playing games. I took a cool copper-colored eight-sided die from that cache with the intention of mounting the die on a necklace to wear. I pursed my lips as I closed the app. There had been no other vehicles in the parking lots, but there were a few buildings nearby that could have hidden a car from view as I drove in. Was I alone? More likely it was one of my friends pranking me. This wouldn't be the first time one of them set up a little surprise for me, and I had told plenty of my urban spelunking friends my plans. One in particular, a guy named Danny, was well known for pranking people. I had shot down Danny several times in the past, so I was understandably suspicious. Most people like that are prickly and don't take disappointment well. I smiled. This was exactly the extra zest that made exploring so fulfilling. The anticipation of being caught had just gone up a level and made me only more determined to explore the hotel. I did not know what game the troll was playing, but if it was Danny and I could somehow make him out to be a fool on the group site, all the better. The first hour was a complete blast. As I mentioned, all of the carnival stalls were open and you could even play some of the games. There was no electricity, of course, but that didn't keep me from setting up the milk bottles or vaulting the counter to get the rings for the ring toss. I won myself a thoroughly lovable little white lion plushie that had somehow evaded being packed up. It was one of my better overall finds, as the pretty kitty showed no signs of mildew or mold. If anything, she looked like she had just been taken out of her packing material. I gleefully attached her to my pack and then made ready for the real adventure, which was exploring the other floors. My first tip for those of you who want to go urban exploring is that you should bring a bag of those cheap rubber door stoppers with you. You do not want to have a security door close and lock behind you. Trust me, the last thing you ever want is the embarrassment of locking yourself into a building when you're trespassing and then having to call the cops to come rescue you. That's happened to a few of my friends. Besides having to deal with the charges and the reality that you might become an interesting news story on a slow news day, in my club, 
You also have to buy everyone drinks if your arrest gets published as an actual story and not just the crime blotter. I'll spare you much of the details from me exploring the hotel's twelve upper floors. Oh, don't get me wrong, I had a complete blast. But I know that much of what I found wouldn't interest most people. Being a hotel, a lot of the doors were locked and closed. Of the few rooms I discovered that were open, only the bed frames remained. Most places you might explore aren't like the movies where you find a place that's been abandoned for generations, but bizarrely is fully furnished. Usually that stuff gets cleared out to help pay off debts. No one leaves a million dollars worth of brand new hotel furniture just sitting there for anyone to come collect. In case you were wondering, the answer is yes. I did find signs of others having been there. One room had police tape across the open doorway and looked like it might have been used for a while by someone to cook meth. From the look of the place, that had happened a while ago. There were signs of squatting in the lower floors, as well as rooms that might have been used as base camps by others like me. However, I saw nothing to indicate anyone else was there. Much to my disappointment, the roller coaster was a complete bust. Apparently someone had worried that someone like me might come poking around and would fall to their death, so they had taken the precaution of welding shut the metal doors to that area. I hate when people anticipate like that. I had hoped to get a cool selfie of myself standing at the edge from the angle of looking down the tracks. All of that was made up for when I passed through the laundry room. Besides finding some washers that were jaw-droppingly huge, I also discovered some old newspapers. One of the articles included the name of the company which had built the carnival, Keiken Industries. A quick Google on my phone told me that Keiken meant danger in Japanese, which I thought was interesting. That was a total score that I decided had to come back home with me. The paper was old, brittle, and had turned light brown. I carefully relocated it to my stash while trying to mentally devise a way to protect it from the storm outside. I didn't want to roll it up or fold it. I had encountered old newspapers before and they can be really brittle. So far I was making excellent time so I decided to eat lunch. After lunch I decided that the time had come for me to explore the main attraction. The House of Mirrors had never been fully explored and I wanted the bragging rights of being the first. For this challenge I had brought along something special. I had actually been in a House of Mirrors once before as a small kid. Walking through a maze of mirrors that was fully lit had been disorientating enough. I did not plan to just skip into this one with only my light to guide me. I would just die of embarrassment if I got lost in there and had to call for search and rescue. That's why I had purchased a spool of string. I would like to claim I thought of that myself, but I actually got the idea from a cartoon. It was the Adventure Time episode where Jake the dog used his shape-shifting powers to elongate himself through a maze. I found my way to the entrance to the House of Mirrors easily enough. It looked almost identical to the photo posted online, which wasn't that shocking. People didn't come here often enough for the scene to have been disturbed. I must admit, though, that I found the entrance to be particularly creepy. There was an air about it that made me think of the lair of some predator. It was the first time I ever recalled hesitating and considering not going somewhere, and I don't know why. It was not like there were ominous footprints in dust leading inside, or splashes of blood on the walls. The scene was just another example of a derelict building sitting empty, but for some reason I found it disturbing. Deciding that I might want to listen to that cautionary inner voice that I normally ignored, I paused at the entrance for five minutes while just listening. Sound carries in an empty building like this where the electricity isn't running, Moving around and not being heard is really difficult. Other than a few minor sounds that I attributed to rats or the building settling, I heard nothing. Oh sure, you can mistake those noises for footsteps or a door closing if you have an overactive imagination. But this wasn't my first rodeo, so to speak. Satisfied that there was no one standing just around the corner with a meat cleaver ready to make short work of me, I tied my string off to the door handle. I also made certain that the door was not going to close on me by both using two of my doorstops and by dragging a heavy old ceramic planter over to block it. If I tripped and fell, I did not want to pull the door shut. In case you were wondering, the door handle was the only thing I could find for securing my string. I checked my camera and light and decided to replace the batteries on the light. Trust me, the first time your light flickers and goes out while exploring you will pee yourself. 
that's one of the moments that horror movies always get right. Not to belabor the point, but if the carnival had been located in an actual city, I would have expected to find the mirrors all broken or tagged with graffiti. Even as remote and unknown as Bivouac was, I was still surprised at how little vandalism I had discovered. I try not to leave evidence of my visitations, but I know that some other urban explorers do that sort of thing. I won't name names, though, Danny. If this had been an actual working carnival attraction, then the only thing missing would have been the flickering strobe light. The ambiance was perfect. The cobwebs and instances of seeing a rat scurry around a corner while its reflections went every direction were particularly heart-stopping. There was a peculiar stillness in the air as I explored the maze. I had already grown accustomed to the lack of background noise you get in the city, but in here the lows were so quiet that when I did hear a noise it was eerily clear. It felt like I could possibly have heard anything in the boundaries of the hotel. I swore that I could even hear the scurrying legs of the few spiders and insects I ran across. The maze was complex. The Hall of Mirrors mazes I had read up on had been pretty simplistic because the mirrors were meant to disorient you. Any time I took a turn, it messed with my sense of direction, and very quickly my orientation with the outside world was suspended. I could not have told you which direction the lobby lay, let alone the entrance. Time seemed to slow in a bad way, as I was forced to backtrack repeatedly. Every time I glanced at my phone, I would discover that only a minute had passed when it had felt like an hour. I was glad I had thought to bring my spool of string. If not for that, I might have actually lost my way. When I came across the first cracked mirror, it startled me. The surface had been clearly broken by a fist. There were flecks of dried blood on the edges of the sharp glass. I would have expected to have found any vandalism nearer to the maze entrance. I wondered what would have made somebody punch the mirror with their bare hand. I suppose it could have been out of frustration if they had gotten lost. After that, I began to find more damaged mirrors. From where they had been fractured, I began to get the sense that someone had been moving much too fast and had been bouncing their body off the mirrors. That made me a bit nervous. It would be a nightmare scenario to run into some meth head in there. I had to repeatedly remind myself that if there was anyone in there with me, that it would be impossible for me not to hear them, that is, unless they had collapsed and were a quiet sleeper. When that thought occurred to me, it gave me goosebumps. I am not the type to panic easily, but at that moment I almost turned around and began tracking my way back. It took all of my resolve to keep on going forward, and I focused my mind on my goal of being the first urban explorer to find their way to the maze's exit. Every turn I made no longer was filled with the anticipation that I was on the correct course, and the dread of discovering another dead end grew. When I turned what I was desperately hoping to be the last corner the next minute, and found myself blocked by nothing but broken glass and distorted images, I had to choke back the urge to scream from frustration. I gave myself a minute to get a hold of my emotions. I could not remember ever being so frustrated. As I pressed the palms of my hands over my eyes, I found that I was trembling and that it was not just from anger. My skin was flush and I could feel my pulse hammering away underneath my skin. I was scared and I did not know why. This was just a silly maze in the middle of nowhere. Compared to other derelict buildings I had explored, the carnival just was not dangerous. I repeated that to myself silently as I began to control my breathing. I had learned from sports and yoga that breath control was essential. Mastering the skill could give you unbelievable endurance, and more importantly, you could gain control over your emotions. Black belts in martial arts can slow their perception of time with breath control and remain calm when faced with pretty dismal odds. Between years of track and field, taking judo as a kid and my passion for urban spelunking, regaining control should have been second nature to me. But as I stood there taking in big gulps of air, I found myself unable to rein in my emotions. An unknown dread was slowly overtaking me, and I began to feel like you do in certain dreams when you know that there is something dangerous nearby. Screw this, I decided out loud, although my voice sounded to me like a raspy whisper. All of the fun had evaporated, and I had come to the decision that the time to cut and bail had arrived. For all I knew, there could be some chemical stored there that was leaking into the area and affecting me. My social media fans would be harsh on me for not exploring the House of Mirrors to the fullest, 
but sometimes things are just insurmountable. I took my hands off my eyes in anticipation of beginning to wind up my spool of string as I backtracked. That was when I saw him. I was, of course, looking directly at my own distorted reflection, as shown by the spider-webbed pattern of the cracked mirror in front of me. My light on my harness had been angled low to keep it from reflecting back and accidentally blinding me. I was standing pretty much in the center of the aisle, at about an arm's length from any wall. At first I could not figure out why I could not see the infinite reflections of me that you get from standing between two mirrors. And then it occurred to me that someone large was standing directly behind me. I spun around while choking on a scream of fright, but found that there was no large man standing directly behind me. Except, as my eyes focused on the new mirror, I could clearly see his distorted bulk once again directly behind me. My shaking became pronounced as I very slowly turned my head, much like I had seen somebody do in a hundred horror movies. My breath caught in my throat as I found no presence in the hall with me, but I could once again see the man standing directly behind me in the reflection. It was impossible for him to have moved quick enough to rotate with me, and more importantly, I would have seen him moving in the surfaces of the mirrors. A whimper died in my throat as my shaking hand grasped the light in order to raise it up so that I could get a better look at the phantom in the mirror. He was incredibly tall. My head barely reached his upper chest. He was also much broader than me, but not as much as you would have thought from his incredible height. His muscular body was wrapped in some manner of dark gray kimono, with a pattern on the cloth so faded and dirty that I could not recognize it. As my eyes wandered up, I saw that he wore a hood of the same material. In the dark cave of his hood, I could only perceive what appeared to be a yellowed porcelain mask painted with an inward spiral of black chipped paint. Some part of my mind supplied me with the information that it was a no mask, although at that moment I couldn't have told you anything else except that name. None of my friends or anyone that I had ever met could have possibly filled out that costume unless someone was sitting on the shoulders of someone else like out of some old Scooby-Doo cartoon, this was definitely not a prank. I could not have told you anything about the man inside the robes, although from his proportions I had to assign him that gender. While his garb was undoubtedly of Eastern origin, I had never heard of anyone from that region of the world being so massive. Even a sumo wrestler would have been dwarfed by him. His chest was expanding and contracting slowly from breathing and very dimly I began to become aware of the sound. A foul odor began to fill my nose. He stank of sweat and what I took to be burnt incense. I had become petrified and could only stand there, my skin becoming rank with the toxins of fear. I wanted to run, to curl into a ball and hide my face, anything except remain standing there. All I could do was watch in horrific fascination the figure standing behind me. My mind finally grasped the fact that he was only reflected in the one mirror, and I felt insanity begin to clutch at me. The figure stirred and there were unnatural ripples underneath his robe. It was as if his body was comprised of nothing but writhing snakes, and where the light was swallowed within the deepest folds of cloth I swore that I could feel eyes looking back at me. His arms raised up and his sleeves slid back to reveal pallid gray hands that were shocking, both for how supple they appeared and the gleaming black talons which had replaced where his fingernails should have been. My mouth opened in what was meant to be an ear-piercing shriek, but only a hollow popping sound of trapped breath being released in gargling rasps came forth. As I watched, his hands encircled the throat of my reflection, and then the fingers of his right hand curled and ripped out my throat. I felt pain, but it was not the agony of having my throat torn out. It was the dim pain you might feel in a dream because your mind is convinced of what you should feel. As my hands sprang to my throat reflexively, I watched as my reflection collapsed to the floor, except she was desperately attempting to keep from choking to death on her own blood. As my image expired, the spell holding me snapped. A scream that I barely recognized as my own split the silence. In an instant I was running and careening off of mirrors. In seconds my string caught on something and in my panic I let the spool be yanked from my grip. There was no thought to my flight. I possessed no plan other than to get away from that monster. Muffled echoes of my pursuer following me became steadily louder. It was eerie, like listening to a movie with the volume turned way down. 
This confused my perception of how close he actually was, and only made everything more frightening. What few glimpses I caught of the giant wearing the no-mask showed him transitioning from mirror to mirror with one long arm stretched out, reaching for me. If not for my myriad of equally panicked reflections, I would have thought the mirrors to be a magician's creative illusion. In my confusion, I mistook a reflection for a corner and hit it full force, causing the glass to crack audibly. As I reeled back, scrambling to change direction, he caught up with me in the reflection. His supple, almost beautiful hand caught the reflection of me by the back of her head, propelling it into the same mirror. Again, only my reflection took the full brunt of his attack as her head hit the surface with a sickening crack of bone shattering. My own head snapped back from the now stronger sensation of pain as he proceeded to batter my twin skull against the mirror. While he was preoccupied with killing me again, I stumbled away. The moment my reflection died, it felt like I had been punched hard in my face. Somehow I managed to find the corner I had been aiming for and flee as he discarded the corpse. Oh, it hurt, and the pain gave me enough clarity to somehow navigate the maze more clearly. I managed to take advantage as I dodged down a different direction when given a choice, counting on my myriad of reflections to confuse him in his pursuit. As I ran, I became aware that not all of the mirrors I passed now showed my image. There seemed to be two of me missing, and that terrified me. What would happen to me if he killed all of my visible reflections? I was just beginning to feel the hope that I had lost him when I tripped over something large and fell painfully to the floor. My gloves kept my hands from being sliced by broken glass, but my cheek hit the floor and came away with a sliver of glass stuck in my skin. I sobbed and gibbered wordlessly as I attempted to roll and kick at what I had hit, believing that he had been lying in wait for me. What I saw was not the man in the no mask, but instead the bulk of Danny lying there. He had collapsed over what I assumed was the loot crate for his geocache post. His face was a rictus of fear, and his head lay at an unnatural angle with a bulge in the neck indicating how he had died. As tears began to flood from my eyes and my head swiveled around, I realized that I had not seen Danny in time, because none of the mirrors surrounding us showed his reflection. Only the cheap wooden box he had died over was shown, but it was not just his loot crate, I realized. His smartphone also lay on the floor. It looked like it had flown from his hand and slid up against one of the walls as Danny died. Whether it was distantly or close by, I could not tell. But the sound of my impending murderer approaching began to become louder. My fall had alerted the man in the no mask to my position. I managed to wipe the tears from my eyes and dislodge the glass shard in the same swipe before grabbing Danny's phone and continuing to flee. I had to remove a glove to press the button to his phone. Danny was lazy and hadn't taken anything like a lock screen seriously, so thankfully I was able to open up his phone. As I careened about the maze, I tried to comprehend the app that showed on the screen. It was difficult to do since I was constantly looking around in the near darkness, trying to plot my next direction change. I realized what I was looking at just when I caught a glimpse of the massive specter getting closer. It was a crude map. The screen looked like graph paper with black lines laid out in a maze pattern. Danny hadn't thought to bring string with him like I had, but he had mapped out part of the maze. Taking advantage of yet another turn, I knelt with my back against one of the mirrors and shut off my light in a vain attempt to hide. The screen's illumination was too bright, so I attempted to smother it with my other hand while I scrolled the image with my thumb haphazardly. Of course, Danny hadn't had time to map out the entire maze before his gruesome death. His murderer must have ambushed him right after he posted his geocache challenge. But he did have the route back to the entrance laid out. On the tiny screen, the maze didn't look nearly as complex as what I had experienced, but I already knew that was due to the mirrors. If I could only figure out where I was, then I could escape. I flicked the map back and gave breathy thanks to Danny's prankster nature. On the map, I clearly saw a tag for where he had left his cache. The muted footsteps on the killer slowed, and I realized he was approaching the corner. His sounds vanished, making my skin prickle. Covering my mouth with both hands in an attempt to muffle my own breathing, I tried my best to will myself invisible. That noxious odor of sweat and incense began to fill my nose again. It was stronger this time. 
I realized that every time he murdered one of my reflections that he became more real to me. Very slowly, as if moving my fingers too quickly would cause a loud noise, I wrapped my fingers around my light as I turned my head to look up at the corner. It was nearly pitch black, so it was easy for my imagination to create figments that were not there. I wondered if he could see in the dark, or if he was as blind as me. With no light there were no reflections. Would he be able to harm me? The odor grew in severity until I felt like retching. When I heard a quiet exhalation of breath I lost my will to remain still. Shrieking like I was eight years old again and waking up from a nightmare, I stood up while turning on the light. The mirror opposite me on the hallway bizarrely showed him impossibly hunched over me from behind, hands reaching down to snatch me up. Fixing my eyes on his image, I turned the light back, aiming it at his face. I barely caught the sight of him holding up one robed sleeve in reaction, but I did get a brief look at the eyes behind the mask. Like his hands, they were supple hinting at an almost feminine beauty being hidden away. His pupils were, of course, black. They dilated like a film being played at enhanced speed and then narrowed in anger. The pain of however he killed me this time as I ran away almost made me collapse in agony. He kept on aiming for my head, and that seemed to compound whatever was happening. This time it felt distinct and almost real. I ran. I hated that maze for not allowing me to open up into a full sprint, out in the open with my training, I could easily have outdistanced him. The distraction of having to use Danny's phone and the screwed-up lighting of my pitiful light bouncing haphazardly over the mirrors allowed him to stay far too close. By the time I felt one of my feet step on my string, I had lost another image. This time he had broken my image's right shoulder and painfully grazed my hip before my reflection died again. I knew that if this continued too much longer, I wouldn't be able to bear the pain, and that it would be over. With my trail of string rediscovered, I managed to gain distance. He didn't pause long when he killed one of my reflections, but he did pause for a crucial second that gave me time. Some part of me feared that this was all part of his cruel game, and that he was holding back on purpose in order to savor his final kill. As I followed my string, I could not help but notice that there were far too few of me now in the mirrors. If he caught me in a dead end now, then there would be no more reflections. I knew that I would die here, horribly and alone. The only people who would know my fate would be his future victims. As I approached the entrance, I could tell he was close on my heels. I gave way to recklessness and poured on the speed, slamming into corners haphazardly and cracking more mirrors. One that must have been a factory defect just shattered outright, spraying glass. One caught my cheek and gave me a fresh cut. By then I could see his reflection in my peripheral vision. In that mirror's reflection the shards of glass caught my killer. Even though his kimono and mask should have protected him, he flinched visibly. He existed in the mirrors. Maybe the mirrors were his Achilles' heel. As I took another corner I purposefully lashed out with my thick-soled shoes at the glass pane at about knee height. The mirror didn't explode like the previous one, but it did send a few slivers of glass flying. One caught him across the cheek of his no-mask. Rather than bouncing off like you would have expected, the shard glass took a slice out of the material. It was impossible to tell accurately between the lighting and my need to continue moving constantly, but I swore that a bead of blood gathered along the cut. His response was violent. Moving faster than a man that size should have been able to, he charged forward and clipped me hard with his hip across my back. I cried out as both me and my reflection shot forward and bounced off another one of the mirrors. As I recoiled, I let myself collapse while rolling to the side, causing a swing of his robed arm to miss me. My father made me take judo courses when I was a kid, so I knew how to fall without hurting myself. As he turned, I lashed out with a foot at another mirror. It cracked and pieces fell out, but I didn't cause anything to fly out towards him. He towered over my image as I crab-walked backwards, my eyes locked on his looming visage. I was only two turns away from freedom, but I was caught at a corner. Everything I had learned about self-defense was nearly worthless against him. The specter was so massive that I doubted I could perform any shoulder rolls or tripping techniques, even if I could touch him. I knew how to break some grapples, but there's a limit to those techniques being able to counter your opponent's size advantage. I lunged towards freedom, attempting to dodge his grab and slip away. 
His arms struck like serpents, sweeping up my image in a bear hug. I gagged from the almost completely real sensation of him smothering me as my reflection disappeared in the volume of his robes completely. His hug didn't restrain me in actuality, but I realized that none of the mirrors I could see showed another me. His grip tightened and I felt my chest constrict, squeezing my breath from my lungs while his masked face gazed down at me with what seemed like a serene calmness. He had me. I could stumble and flee for all I was worth, but in the end I would die just yards from escaping the Hall of Mirrors. My poor, battered light caught the twinkle of a lightning bolt-shaped shard of glass lying on the floor. Without thinking, I snatched it up and rose, legs shuffling towards the corner. Rather than pursuing me, he hunched over. I heard something crack loudly in my chest and I bent forward, gasping from the pain. There was the sensation of his robes covering my mouth and his odor was overwhelming. I could feel his muscular arms across my chest compressing my breasts as he forced the breath from my lungs like pressing a knee on a pair of old bagpipes. I was aware of darkness growing at the edges of my vision as my body was being starved for oxygen. It was like drowning on dry land, and it was indescribably horrible. He isn't holding me, I thought, trying to convince myself. He's doing this to my reflection, not me. I'm free to move. The hand holding the dagger of glass at my side slowly rose a foot, extending slowly towards the way I wanted to run. By then the feeling that his body and robes were wrapped around me like some sickly cocoon felt completely real. I was seconds away from blacking out. I snapped my arm back down, aiming the point of the glass towards where I imagined his kidney would be. It felt like I was stabbing a block of cheese as it suddenly met resistance. His response was to hold me tighter still. A croaking sound escaped my throat, and I stabbed backwards again and then a third time. The final plunge left me with the feeling of something warm and sticky oozing between the gap of glove and shirt sleeve. A keening moan escaped from him as he flinched. As the pressure around my chest lessened, I twisted and my reflection slipped out of his grip. In the mirror my reflection came out of his robes like a newborn sliding out of her mother. Both of us somehow mustered the strength to duck a hand reaching out to grab us by the neck and push forward. When another hand began to grasp us by the shoulder, I sliced it viciously with the glass. The monster recoiled in pain and this time I saw the cut on its hand. I wasn't sure if it was in fact me that was hurting it or my reflection, but I damn well didn't care. I wanted this evil thing to hurt, to feel the agony it had inflicted on me and my friend Danny. I must have blacked out partially for a second. The next thing I knew I was stumbling towards the open steel doors to the House of Mirrors. I felt exhausted in the way you become after depleting your body's reserves of adrenaline. Those last handful of feet felt like I was climbing a mountain as I moved forward until my hand finally grasped the door handle. Glancing back I saw the thing standing behind my reflection again in the mirror, although this time it was distant from me. Blood was dripping from its wounded hand and something about its posture radiated pure malice. Had I gone beyond the border to where it could affect the real world, my chest heaving as I gulped in fresh, delicious oxygen, I managed to tow aside the two doorstops before pressing my hip against the planter to cause it to grind against the floor tiles aside. It stared at me throughout in a way that I imagined how a butcher looked at a hunk of meat hanging on a hook. As the door began to squeal closed on hinges that needed oiling, I purposefully raised a hand towards it and gave it the middle finger. I also told it what it could do with itself, as the gap between door and door frame shrank. Six inches from the door closing, the thing blurred, lunging at me faster than any person could ever sprint. I screamed and fell to the floor as the door closed. There was not even the sound of it impacting with it, but my throat felt like his fingers had closed briefly over it. I rolled onto all fours, clutching at my esophagus as I forced air through it. Each breath was exquisite agony. His ghostly fingers had come close to collapsing my trachea forever. But I was alive. It took me an hour to get enough energy to stand after that. I spent most of that time crying while curled up in a fetal position on the floor. My body hurt. One of my ribs felt like it was broken. There was dried blood on my face and I knew without stripping that my upper chest was heavily bruised. I spent my time grieving over Danny's death and debating how much time I would spend in an asylum if I called emergency services to report what had happened. 
I'll spare you the story of me stumbling out into the storm and driving away, other than to tell you that I did take long enough to get my pack from the fallback point. When I got into my trusty Justy, I stared at my rearview mirror hard for a second, and then slapped it down so that I couldn't see anything in it. My reflection appeared transparent to me, as if I had in fact died and was now a ghost. I meant to call nine, eleven on Danny's phone and just leave it in the parking lot, but apparently I had lost it in that damned maze of mirrors. I'm posting this on the group site so that someone can think up a way to get Danny's body safely out of the Carnival Hotel in Bivouac, Colorado. His parents don't deserve to go through all of that pain of him being a missing person. That, and to tell you to avoid that hotel at all costs. Just because I only encountered the apparition in the Hall of Mirrors did not mean he is constrained to that area. I am not certain if that no-mask-wearing creature is still in there. The mind is a funny thing. I've been in therapy now for three months because of what happened. Wherever I go, I keep my eyes down if I see a shiny surface. I can't even look someone else in the eye for fear I'll see my reflection. Out here in the real world, I just have the one reflection now, no matter how many windows or mirrors there might be. He haunts my dreams, forever in pursuit of killing me. And every once in a while, if it's dark enough, I'll catch a glimpse of him. I don't know if he's a product of PTSD or not, and I don't want to find out. Trust me when I say, stay away from that mirrored maze in that old hotel. You don't want to find out the hard way if I'm crazy or not. Well, unfortunately, this is possum country. And while, yes, it's true, they wander the wildernesses of night alone. They seem to love company when crossing the street. In fact, the more the merrier. And we don't even need to mention a family crossing. I'm sure you can imagine what type of fresh hell awaits there. Now, there is a solution to all this, of course. Run them over which in some ways can be worse than actually encountering them in the first place. And given their propensity for crossing the street at the most blindest of corners of the road, it may be a solution whether you'd like it to be or not. I admit I've hit a few, unintentionally of course, well at least all but one of them, which we'll come back around to. Oh, I just realized that I've gone through this entire rant without introducing myself. So, um, hi, I guess. Um, I'm not keen on talking about myself because, to be honest, there's not really much to say. I'm a twenty-something loner who, up until recently, was living out of their parents' basement. Or at least I would have been if we'd been rich enough to have a basement. I guess that's my only real differing trait, really, is that I was fortunate enough to leave them before I was thrown out. My parents were the very definition of hypocrites, the type who'd nitpick the slightest thing you did wrong and then do whatever it was they said you did was the wrong way, the same way you just did it. And I guess I'd just finally reached my breaking point of them breathing down my neck constantly. You know what I mean, the, yes, I was in a rush to not be late for work this morning and didn't do the dishes. Yes, I was half asleep while using the bathroom in the middle of the night last night and left the toilet seat up. Yes, I'm a human being and can't be perfect 24-7 like you. Same shit. New shoes with toxicity to spare. You get the idea. The only saving grace I had was my job. Where I wasn't bothered by them for eight straight hours. Not exactly bliss, though, because I was a cashier and had run-ins with customers that'd make you want to hang yourself with their own entrails. But after a few months of enduring the maladies of both, I saved up enough to move out on my own. And then when I left them, nothing. I got nothing. Not a good luck, son or a will miss you, or even just a good. Eh, uh, who needs them? I mean, once, when I was seven, they decided it would be a good idea to leave me at the park. I mean, granted, I didn't want to go yet, but still, it's not an okay thing to do. Though I can't say I blame them here either, with my aspirations of wanting to be a writer and nothing happens for four years. It'd tend to wear on you, but they just don't understand. These things take time and a bit of luck. Sorry, I got off track here. Uh, right. So I was settling into a semi-change in my life. The only new thing was that I now had a new apartment and had to figure out how to pay rent. Not much was that different, to be honest. I was still going to work as a cashier at a local supermarket, still getting chewed out by customers who are just now being told no for the first time in a long, long time, still getting shitty meager paychecks that just barely gave me enough to make ends meet, still driving home in that crap car of mine. Sorry, I don't mean to sound bitter about it. 
In all honesty, the car's not that bad. It's a hand-me-down, and it's fine, I guess. It works. Just you can't park it on a hill because the brakes like to give out, and if they do, you better hope you can catch it in time to stop it from crashing into anything. Yeah. What I'm actually bitter about is that after three and a half years of working at my thankless job, I was given the fat end of a short stick when downsizing reared its ugly head. I don't know why, though. They wouldn't tell me, but needless to say, it ate away at me like a maggot gnawing its way through skin to get at the finer meat. I was furious when they told me. I clenched my fists and cursed the sky's many names, all done internally, of course, because at that point, being that far into a job that requires customer service, you're half dead already. And while I was walking back to my car, I remember feeling the first twinge of sheer terror. Terror at the thought that had finally crossed my mind. The idea of not knowing how long it'd be till I got another paycheck. How was I going to pay my bills? How was I to pay for my rent, for my food? I remember feeling both tension and weakness in my legs at the same time next. So much so that any of my next steps could have been the one where they could have given out on me. And I would flop over like how those things like to react when they see binocular lights in the distance and coming closer, struck with sudden death syndrome. I didn't, though. I made it to my car and got in, mind swirling with what ifs and what nexts. And as I turned my car key in the ignition and my clunker of a vehicle roared to life, I couldn't help but feel like I was driving my own hearse to my own funeral as I left the parking lot, which was not too long before. It happened. I swear, I swear, I didn't, no, I didn't, Fuck, what did I do? I, uh, I was distracted, to say the least, mined amidst a maelstrom with howling winds and a raging colossal whirlpool, whose base led ever deeper into the pitch-black waters of fear and anger and anguish. I tried to distract myself from my thoughts by listening to loud, hard, and fast music, and was also admittedly speeding. Truth be told, I wasn't sure what my actions would accomplish, but whatever they were, they weren't healthy or helping. And that's when I saw it. That's when I saw them, bright eyes in white lights. This is possum country. I knew what they meant, and by now you should too. They appeared at the exit of a blind curve that led up to a steep hill. There was only one pair of them, though, and no one around. No one who'd care about them anyway. So, I thought. So I did what I'd never done before. I closed my eyes and put my foot to the floor, and I... Fuck! I'm so sorry. God, I swear I... Um... As I said before, I have hit a few possums, unintentionally, and also, as I said, possums have this weird affinity towards crossing roads at the blindest of curves. Curves where you'd have to be nothing short of a street racer to be able to avoid them. And because I had hit a couple, I knew what to expect as my eyes shut tight and waited for the wheels to hit and go over the unfortunate speed bump. See, whenever you hit a possum or anything for that matter, you're going to first experience the impact and since it's possums for me, it's usually aggravation follows. Then experience the shock of impact, which, let's be honest, I'm more than numb to at this point. This may be strange and in its own way a touch disturbing, but I digress. However, I will say that as my eyelids clamped shut, I also noticed something off about this one possum. It had been so covered in muck that the thing's white fur looked off, almost a beige color, and then felt and heard the telltale thump thump. I then waited for the smell. You remember the smell, right? More malador than death. Yeah, when you hit a possum, it tends to stain your car, and it takes weeks to scrub and air out. But this time it would have been worth it. But this time there wasn't one. There was no smell. Nothing. It was indeed off-putting and bittersweet, to say the least. But I decided to not worry about it and continued to drive home. Once there, I pulled in the driveway, turned the car off, and got out like what had just happened didn't. And as I walked up to my door, I hesitated. I don't know why or what caused me to be so curious, but I wanted to see the damage done. I wanted to see if I'd actually hit it or not. I turned back around, walked up the front of the car, and crouched down. I looked at the grill to see if it had anything wrong with or on it, which it didn't. Then I got down, laying on my side to see the wheel and if there was anything underneath. There wasn't. Huh. I took my phone out, unlocked it, and turned on my phone's flashlight, and that's when I saw it. It was an eye, dangling down like one of those tennis balls your parents would put in their garage to help them park. 
but weirder still is it wasn't black. It had the white outer coating like an olive, but the eye was blue. Strange. I don't remember opossums ever having blue eyes, but I do remember a few cats and dogs do, but that doesn't make sense. The creature I hit was too big for a cat and too small for a dog. What did I hit? Shit! That next moment I dropped and picked it up just as quick, afraid I'd damaged it. But when I did, I also saw something else lodge in my tire tread. The best I could describe is, it was a white rock or pebble or something. I don't know why, but curiosity had taken over again, and I plucked it out and held it up to the light for a better look to see it was a... tooth. A molar, I think. Which is also weird, right? I don't remember possums having molars, at least not like these. In all honesty, it actually reminds me of when I was seven and bit a rock candy stick in my own no. No, 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 that's stupid. Why would there be a... and in the middle of the... what kind of parent would... My eyes grew wider as the thought grew. It would be impossible, wouldn't it? And a moment passed, increasingly unbearable. The very idea was insane and impossible, isn't it? I couldn't control myself any longer. I had to know. I hopped up and scuttled over to the driver's side of my car and got in. I turned the key in the ignition once more and threw the car in reverse. My car zoomed backward and out of the driveway. I cranked the wheel hard so I would be going the way I came from, my usual route to work, and threw the transmission in drive. I couldn't stop myself from lead-footing the gas pedal. My tires squealed for traction, and once they found it. I and the car were shot forward like we were trying to get back to 1985 only. Instead of it being ridiculous in the comedic sense, it was in the horrific sense. It was impossible. It was impossible. It was impossible. I sped along the road, and it wasn't that long till I came across two of them, white eyes and bright lights. I tried to swerve out of the way, but I going too fast. Fui dump thump. My shoulders and face scrunched at the sound, knowing I'd hit them on purpose, no less, and it reminded me of what I might have hit as well. And then I came across another pair of white brights. This time, though, they'd barely set foot on the road, and I was able to maneuver around them with ease. But I couldn't help feel their eyes burning in through the car's doors and chassis. And then another, and then another, and then another. A whole family of them. And there was no way to dodge around any of them. So I gritted my teeth, closed my eyes, and floored it again. Fum, 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 fum. It sounded like the world's most disgruntling machine gun, but I had no time to process it fully. I was almost there. My car went up the same hill and slammed my foot on the brake at the top of it. Seeing it, not well, but I couldn't stand driving anymore. I pulled the parking brake and got out. I anxiously jog-hopped over to the thing for a closer look. And, no, no, it, it can't, it wouldn't. But it was, all the strength gave out in my legs and I fell to my knees before it. A baby, maybe a year. In purple and yellow rocket ship pajamas, head crushed under the weight of my car. I wanted to yell, I wanted to scream, but I just, I couldn't. I just sat there, speechless and staring. The fuck was it doing in the road? The hell did it? My thoughts were cut short upon hearing my car make a skirting noise from up the hill, the sound of the parking brake coming loose. I looked back to see its headlights barreling towards me. I froze a moment, then flopped over on the road. It continued rushing towards me, picking up speed now. The headlights finally struck my eyes, hurting them something fierce, and whatever 